Good evening, colleagues and citizens. Uh, welcome to the February 12, 2014 system oversight meeting of the Prince George's County Board of Education. Uh, this evening, we will be discussing uh, operating and supporting services. Uh, as always, before we begin, I want to remind folks, please, to turn off your phones and or put them on vibrate. Um, we are, um, uh, and also, uh, before we begin, colleagues, let me, as, uh, as we often do, uh, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, we know we started significantly late this evening, and we know you folks are busy. I can only uh, tell you uh, that um, the business of running this system is not very easily done <laughs> in the time windows that we're given in these meetings, and so we apologize. Uh, when we tend to go longer than anticipated. Uh, but that said, let's get this one started so we can all uh, get home at a reasonable hour. Uh, and at that, I will ask Ms. Boston, please, uh, to lead the board prayer and pledge of allegiance. Ms. Boston, that's what I said. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Boston. Mrs. Berkeley, would you please call the roll? Good evening, board members. Good evening. Dr. Anderson. Mr. Burroughs. Here. Ms. Epps. Ms. Eubanks. Here. Ms. Hernandez. Present. Ms. Jacobs. Here. Dr. Kaufman. Here. Ms. Mundy. Happy to be here. Ms. Quinteros Grady. Present. Mr. Valentine. Here. Ms. Williams. Present. Mr. Taylor. Ms. Boston. Present. Dr. Eubanks. Present. Um, and uh, colleagues may have a motion uh, to adopt this February 12, 2015. Uh, system oversight meeting agenda. Ms. Jacobs, would you like to make a, would you like to amend this motion? Ms. Jacobs or, or Mr. Yes. Burroughs? Okay. I'd like to move non-agenda comment speakers up to 3.1. It has been moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Colleagues, we have a, a motion to adopt the February 12, 2015 system oversight meeting agenda as amended. So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Colleagues, may I please have that motion is approved. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the January 22nd, 2015 board meeting minutes and the January 29th, 2015 budget work session minutes? So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or amendments? Seeing none. All Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, let's start with uh, uh, all those in favor of approving the January 22nd board meeting minutes, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? That motion carries. All those in favor of, the, of accepting the minutes from the January 29th budget work session, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you, that motion carries. Um, we're going to uh, move to uh, a legislative agenda. Uh, so let's go, let's go right into that and I'll yield the floor. Uh, Dr. Kaufman, oh, not, I'm sorry. That's, that's not, I'm, I saw your light on. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm wanting to make a motion, yeah. but I don't know yeah. if it's appropriate let's to do wait, it this time yeah. or wait until she's Yeah, we'll wait till she's done. I just saw your light. I, I thought you wanted it. All right, so let's go to our, our spectacular Associate General Counsel, Demetria Tobias, for our legislative report. 
You are so kind, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. You Good have a, a copy of our uh, legislative report before you, so I won't go through everything, but I'll just uh, start briefly with um, a couple of items on the budget. As you know, we've been tracking everything very closely and uh, meeting with key members of our delegation and, and uh, General Assembly leadership to advocate for the restoration of our education funding. Um, I'm pretty sure you have, have been uh, following everything very closely as well, and um, the budget review is going to happen on the House side first. Speaker Bush and Delegate McIntosh are, are uh, working with um, other members of the House on a plan to help hopefully restore much of the cuts that the governor has proposed in his budget. So we'll be tracking those very closely and the budget hearings are going to begin on the BRFA items on March 3rd and March 4th. So I will um, be pleased to bring you an update at your next meeting of that information. Moving ahead to the bills for your review. The policy committee met on February 5th, and there are four bills before you for a full vote today. The first bill is uh, PG 40715. This is the um, turf fields bill, and it would require the Board of Education to install turf fields at all of your high schools over the course of the next four years. <clears throat> Excuse me, we were pleased and, and honored to have Delegate uh, Walker join the policy committee at a meeting and he was available to answer a lot of the uh, committee's questions. Um, overall, the, the recommendations in support of the bill are the fact that overall longevity, there would be uh, significant cost savings to the school system in terms of maintaining, maintaining fields. Um, there's certainly been support for these uh, from Dr. Maxwell, who, who oversaw the installation of turf fields at all schools in Anne Arundel uh, County. Um, there's certainly a good case for um, improving the condition of many of our home fields, um, many of which cannot be used um, but a limited number of times um, due to uh, the maintenance costs and the effect of weather, et cetera. Um, and also there are some safety arguments that have been advanced in terms of uh, reducing the um, uh, high incidences of student injuries um, and uh, increasing usage on the field. Um, certainly cost was a concern for the committee. Um, the capital uh, funding has been, uh, there's been a proposed decrease in the capital funding for next year, including program open space money, um, which has covered the uh, turf fields that we've had installed to date. So the committee's ultimate uh, recommendation uh, were, really were twofold. One, it was to support with amendment, but to clarify that the funding source for um, any installation of the fields would have to be external and would not be a part of the uh, board's operating budget. And the second amendment would be to make uh, the, the order of the schools um, selected for the installation of the fields subject to the board's approval. Um, you own the fields. And uh, you know, among other things, what your what your capital priorities, uh, what your capital, uh, yeah, priorities are. And so, there's language that we would like to suggest in the bill that, based on geographic location, uh, student enrollment, and the field condition, uh, would make the the um, field subject to your approval. So those are the two amendments uh, from the policy committee: support with amendment to clarify funding, outside source and um, to make the list of installations subject to the board's approval. Would you like me to keep going? Okay. Second bill for your consideration is for PG 40815. This is the Certified County-Based Business Participation Bill. Um, this bill has been amended from the version that you first saw when we presented it to you a meeting or so ago. And what the bill would now be is enabling legislation. It would allow you but not require you to um, establish a, a business participation program for uh, county-based businesses. Really what the intent of this bill is, is to increase opportunities for local businesses. Um, an identical bill was put in by the Council for um, Parks and Planning, uh, WSSC, and the community colleges as well. And the intent here is to give you the flexibility to craft a program that makes sense for you. Um, the policy committee liked that idea, but they wanted to go a step further in um, recommending that there be an MOU developed between the board or subcommittee of the board and the subcommittee of the, of the council that really puts some teeth to this program and identifies really some concrete ways that the, the board is going to follow through on it. So the recommendation before you this evening would be to support with amendment 
and there's going to be there would be one technical um, correction just to the the authorization language it would be the board's program um, in consultation with the CEO and secondly authorizing this MOU that the board could enter with the county council to really um, uh, address your commitment in implementing the program the third bill is PG 412 15 this is Delegate Washington's bill that would establish an alternative to school suspension in three of your high schools over a two-year period. The um, purpose of the bill would be um, in lieu of suspension uh, to, for, and to be clear, this would be for nonviolent and non-sexual offenses um, to provide students with a community service alternative. So they would receive um, some type of community service opportunity, which would, which would be created and developed and managed by the school system in lieu of the days of suspension that they would have received. Um, certainly the committee appreciates the intent of the bill and there's a clear language in your legislative platform of your supporting um, alternatives to, you know, to meeting the needs of, of students with discipline challenges. But there were multiple implementation concerns that the committee had with the bill and um, Significantly, as you know, the State Department of Education um, did a comprehensive review of uh, school discipline um, regs and um, uh, adopted a whole series of changes that local boards have to follow in you know, educating and supervising children who are on, on out-of-school suspension. So we already have much in the way of state law that, that says uh, what type of educational services have to be provided or should be provided to students who are on suspension. But as importantly, you have your own code of student conduct and your student rights and responsibilities handbook that provides a, a range of options for, um, for um, out of school suspension. These options are available to schools to use as they see fit. Principals have discretion, school leadership have discretion in what they choose. Um, some examples are um, uh, community service and beautification projects, cafeteria duty and in-school service, parent shadowing, community conferencing or mediation, Saturday school, substance abuse counseling if needed, and teen court. So the, the committee's view was that if the idea was to expand what you already offer, the best way to do that would be to work throughout your existing um, uh, policies and procedures and, and a bill would not be required to do that. So for those reasons, their recommendation is, is to oppose the bill. The next bill is PG 413. It's the Prince George's New School Construction Investment Act. This is um, Chair Jay Walker's and uh, Delegate Washington's bill that would authorize the county council to raise sales tax in our county by one cent um, for to cover exclusively uh, costs for new schools or major renovations at schools. It has to be at least a, a 50 percent. Um, uh, renovation that's approved by this board and the county council. Um, the, the bill would not take effect immediately. It would be subject to a referendum in November 2016. And if the referendum passed, the bill would then take uh, effect in um, 2017. The, the potential fiscal um, revenue for the school system, at this point the estimate is between 60 and 100 million dollars a year. And the, the committee's view was that in light of uh, the, the um, capital maintenance backlog that you all know so well, uh, they wanted to support efforts to come up with creative ways to help fill that gap. And so their recommendation is to support the bill. And the last bill for your consideration is the Youth Wellness Leadership Pilot Program. You'll see two two versions of the bill here. Essentially, the, the bill is entered two ways. It, will, it would either apply only to our county, um, one high school in our county, or it would apply to our county and one other high school in the state. But what the bill does is it establishes this youth wellness program. The, the program would actually be housed in MSDE um, in consultation with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And the purpose is to teach health and wellness advocacy among youth and to help them improve their skills in academic performance, peer education, leadership, career development, and economic well-being. 
um, the committee was in favor of the bill. The, the one amendment that they wanted to recommend was uh, to clarify the funding stream because based on the fiscal analysis that DLS did with the same bill last year, there was a potential cost to based on their analysis, there was a potential cost to the, to the school system of about $6,300 or so for transportation if there was a, a conference sponsored for this program. So they uh, are recommending to support with the amendment to clarify the funding stream. And that is the last bill for your review this evening. Thank you. So colleagues, what we'll do, you see the, uh, uh, these five bills that, that are before you um, that we can take action uh, with, with these bills uh, as a whole based on the recommendations for the committee. I will offer if anyone wants to pull any for further debate, we'll do that. And so I'm gonna, I'll start with Dr. Kaufman, you were on that. Yeah, I would like to pull um, 40715, the turf fields bill, and um, uh, 413.15, the new school construction investment bill for discussion and debate. All right. Those have been pulled. Mr. Burroughs? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to accept. I first want to thank the, the policy committee for all of their work. Uh, I sit on the policy committee. Oh. Ms. Jacob sits on the policy committee. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Anderson sits on the policy committee. Uh, yes, I chair the policy committee. Ms. Jacobs is the vice chair. Dr. Anderson is on the committee. Um, uh, Ms. Valentine and Dr. Eubanks are also on the committee. I want to thank them for their work in the administration, um, George and Sean, you know, everyone, um, for, for their hours of intensive deliberation and debate around these important topics. So thank you. Um, with that being said, I'd like to move to accept all of the committee's recommendations as a whole. And uh, I'd like a second. So We've our, one of our members has already asked to pull them, so are you, you want to move to accept the ones other than the ones that have been pulled? I'm moving to accept all of them. All right, he's already, just like we would do in first reader, if someone wants to pull something for further debate, they have a right to do that, so that's been done. So we can approve the rest and then have answer questions or discussions about these other ones. Does it yep. require a second? No, you, when, you, when you do first reader, if you want to pull something for further discussion, it doesn't require a second. So, so those have been pulled for further discussion, and so we can do accept a motion for the ones that are grouped that haven't been pulled. I hear you. Uh, my motion is to accept the committee's recommendations in whole, and I believe I heard a second. I second. From Dr. Anderson. I, I understand that, but, the, the, but two will be pulled for further discussion. So that, just like you would in first reader, you know, then, then, then these two will be pulled for further discussion. Yeah, 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 so the, the, he can, we're going to pull them for discussion um, as we always and right. do, and but we, my and, motion and vote is, on them, and we're going to vote on them separately. Mr. Then that Bob. would be a separate motion. All right, so let me go back then. He, let me go back then. We'll, 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 we'll call it a motion. Is there a second for your motion? Second. That, move, that motion's been moved and seconded to pull those two items for further discussion. After there's a motion already on the floor? No, if you, uh, what, what he did was he wanted to pull some items, which is exactly the process that I said we would follow, just like in, in, in first reader. If you want to challenge that process, then he has a right to change, since he was uh, uh, on the floor first, to change his to a motion to pull those for further discussion. Now, I frankly don't feel like he needs a motion to change for further discussion. It just, if this is a, as it is with first reader, every person has a right to offer to the, to the committee to debate any and every one of these. Should we get Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, if I may, generally we make a motion, we get a second, and then we move into discussion. Are you, uh, okay, I've made uh, my ruling. Are you challenging my ruling? Yes. Okay, Ms. Battle. So it's sort of like how you deal with consent agenda. Okay, here you it's very similar to how you would do with consent agenda. So quite often you all will pull items three and seven off the consent agenda. You'll move the consent agenda and then you'll vote on the other two items separately. I think that's what you're trying to do. I guess my question for council is, if there's a motion and a second on the floor. So I would, if, if this, just as that process was going, I would not allow a motion under a consent agenda 
for items that have been pulled for further discussion. I would not allow that motion. That motion would be out of order. Dr. Anderson? I think this recommendation differs from the consent agenda items. This is a recommendation from a board committee. And the chair of the committee is recommending that this board approve of the report from the policy committee. And that has been seconded. And when a motion is moved and seconded, there's time for discussion. So we can discuss all of the items. And I think in the case with Dr. Kaufman, he did indicate that he wanted to pull some, but that was not a motion. The only motion, the first motion on the floor was the one that was presented by Mr. Burroughs. So I, I think it's out of order to request, you know, that so, uh, a person make a, a second motion after one is already on, on, the, uh, no, on the, the floor. So again, you could challenge the motion. The, 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 the ruling of the chair is we're going to go through this. And in fact, we'll go through them one at a time. We'll go through each of these recommendations from the committee one at a time, the, and, and the whole board has to vote on, on each of these. So we will go through each of them one at a time, and I'll accept a motion uh, for whether or not the board, uh, a motion on 407.15 uh, on the turf fields amendment. I've ruled that motion out of order. So, right, we're, right, we're going to recalibrate that this is not, you know, when we bring each of these to the floor, the committee uh, has a right to review each of them. Now, one of your colleagues has already requested a debate on an item. You are attempting to deny his ability to debate the item, and I'm not going to allow it. I'm not going to allow it. So once again, uh, we can. Uh, uh, I've I've made my ruling. So are you you're challenging the ruling of the chair? What's what's the process? I think the easiest thing to do at this point would be to vote Mr. Burrell's motion up or down. So he made a motion for for you to rule on the entire report. You can decide whether or not you guys want to do that or not. So if you vote on the motion and it loses, then you can go back and vote on them individually. So uh, the motion then, we'll do that. The motion is to um, accept the entire slate uh, of the recommendation of the committee. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? You you want further you um, All right, say so now would you call the roll please? Motion to accept the policy legal and legislative committee and general counsel's recommendation of all bills presented today. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Burroughs? Yes. Ms. Epps? Absent. Ms. Eubanks? No. Ms. Hernandez? No. Ms. Jacobs? Aye. Dr. Kaufman? No. Ms. Mundy? Yes. Ms. Quinteros Grady? No. Mr. Valentine? No. Ms. Williams? Mr. Taylor? Absent. Ms. Boston? No. Dr. Eubanks? No. Four ayes, eight nays, two absent. That motion fails. Uh, I'm going to then uh, ask that we go through these one at a time. Uh, and I'll entertain a motion. Uh, for uh, PG 40715 on the turf fields. 
So is this, um, are we open for discussion at this point or do we actually have to put, put a motion? Let's put a motion on the floor. Uh, and the motion could be to accept the recommendation or to do something different. Okay. Um, I move um, not to accept the re recommendation on the turf fields bill of the committee. And what position would you, uh, do you want to, uh, in your motion, recommend what we do do? Um, my motion would be to oppose the bill. Is there a second? I second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? <clears throat> I, I keep turning you off. Are you, Mr. Burroughs? Yes. I just wanted to, to clarify for the public um, something that you mentioned earlier, Dr. Eubanks. Uh, by no means was my motion or what you saw an attempt to uh, not allow discussion, um, Dr. Kaufman's discussion. When you make a motion and then there is a second, it automatically opens it up for debate and discussion. So to characterize it as something other than what it was, I, I find extremely offensive. Um, what, what happened was there was an attempt to change the position on two of these items uh, after the committee had already voted and did the work. And moments before the meeting, some political shenanigans or foolery occurred and you're out of order. Are you going to are you going to debate the, your, the motion, or are you going in, are you going another direction? I think what you're trying to do is uh, to silence <laughs> your key, uh, I, I, silence. You know my comments stick, about what you've stick, attempted to do. St stick with stick with the the amendment. The motion that's on the floor, which is what you yeah. insisted I do. Come on. I mean, and, and, and <laughs> I'll, I'll debate the bill. Um, because I'm not going to go back and forth with you over this like this. I think it's inappropriate. Uh, I think the committee uh, worked extremely hard um, on this. We support, at the end of the day, our fields are, are, are not in the best position. Uh, and Delegate Walker is attempting to uh, upgrade all the fields in the county. A part of the committee's recommendation is to say that we don't want to have to use any of our operating budget or any of our funds to do it. We support what he's trying to do. We support upgrading all of our fields uh, to turf fields because we believe that our students should play on the highest quality fields possible. But we recognize that we have a tremendous uh, uh, shortage of resources and, and we cannot afford to do it ourselves. And so I would um, support uh, the committee's uh, recommendation. So moved. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Um, this was a motion that, or a, uh, an item that I wanted to discuss for personal, I mean, not for personal reasons, but for my own reasons, and nothing to do with political shenanigans. Um, I greatly appreciate the committee's work on this bill as well as all the other bills, and I actually think that the amendments that were made were certainly a significant improvement to the bill, and I, wanna, I don't want to take anything away from the committee's work to do that. Um, I, uh, just on a personal note, um, when I was in high school, I ran track. Um, I was on competitive runner. Um, I fully support, you know, uh, students having the, uh, op op you know, opportunity to participate in varsity and junior varsity sports and have other options. Um, and in fact, I had to run on a cement track for a couple years and uh, my body is still paying for it. So I certainly understand the need to provide our students with um, the facilities and the equipment that's going to help with their, you know, that's going to maintain their health and safety um, and, and certainly support efforts to do that. The, the issue I have with, with, this, um, with this particular bill, though, is um, I think for two reasons. One, I mean, they're, they're both philosophical issues. One is that here's another example of where the legislature is even with all these amendments taken into account, the legislature is basically dictating to us what our strategy should be for replacing turf fields. And while I think there may be a very good case, particularly in certain schools where there are um, you know, fields that are way out of date and have safety issues, and I would fully support us you know, examining those and addressing those, mm -hmm. 
I don't think this kind of approach of where the, even with these amendments, basically there's a requirement for us to replace the turf fields, granted with, the, with, with these amendments, um, is the best course of action. I think it should be something we should be dealing with as a district locally on a case-by-case -case basis. The other issue, which is also philosophical, but I think is even a bigger issue for me is, you know, we've talked a lot in, in these meetings, particularly around the, the budget discussions about what our priorities are. And certainly we want to try to do everything we can to give students a well-rounded education in all different areas. But I feel like this bill sends a message that replacing turf fields is a high priority for us when we have so many other needs in the school system, academic and otherwise. And I find it hard to support a piece of legislation that's putting that up to the top of the list of priorities. And I think we know from the research, we know from the experience in around, elsewhere in this country and other countries that while certainly high, um, high school sports can be a, you know, an avenue for some students to get scholarships and can uh, help them with their academic route, that in many cases um, it takes, you know, there, there's, there's an argument that there's uh, too much emphasis on sports and not enough on academics. And, you know, we're at a, a critical point in this district's juncture where we're trying to really make sure that we hone in on those things that are going to make the most difference to our kids' education. So for that reason, I wanted to discuss and debate it. Um, I put out a, you know, a motion to oppose it. I would certainly be willing to take a no position as well, but I think that it's from a, you know, again, it's not, it's not taking anything away from the committee's work on this, and I, again, I appreciate the amendments, but I just have a problem philosophically supporting this bill as it stands, even with the amendments. Thank you. Ms. Jacobs. Thank you. Um, so this issue comes up year after year. This isn't the first time we've had um, this piece of legislation come up. And we've had discussions consistently about whether or not this is a board priority. And I think it's really clear that the priorities that we have as a board are around academics. And this particular bill has nothing to do with offsetting that. Um, we were very specific to make sure that funds weren't, to, in our full discussion, was to make sure that funds were not coming out of operating expenses. Um, I've lost count. This might be the fourth year that this has come up. It's a trend that's happening across um, school districts and school districts that are implementing turf fields are not using and are not supporting using operating funds to do it. I think there's a balance um, that has to be made. I ran track, although we probably can't tell that these days. Um, that being the case, I think it's really interesting. Um, at some point, we have to make a decision. The administration supports turf fields. What they don't support is that we use operating funds to, to, to pay for them. And, 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 and we agree. What we're saying is, what the committee discussion was, was this bill continues to come up. I think we laid out some very specific things that we think are important for the community. I know my constituents have said to me that they support turf fields, although years past, I voted no for reasons of recommendations that we not spend operating funds and that we are clear about what our priorities are. I think we are clear about our priorities. And that being said, I would I think my colleagues, um, I think this, the committee put together a reasonable alternative for funding and not to mention to not have the legislature tell us um, what order to, to put those turf fields. Dr. Maxwell and his staff have put together a, a CIP program that they submit to the board every year and should this bill pass, I'm sure they would make some recommendations to the board on that issue as well. And so I think as well within our purview to um, that, that these are not, these are not um, one or the other items to discuss around academics and priorities. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Uh, yes. Uh, Ms. Jacobs made several of the points that I wanted to make. Um, um, but I find it curious in a budget that's $1.8 billion to suggest that a 20 million dollar cost is a priority item. It just doesn't seem to make sense. 
uh, it, and, and maybe that's on the low end of what the turf fields would cost in the high schools in Prince George's County, uh, but I think somewhere between 20 and $25 million. So I, I, that part of the argument I'm, I'm trying to understand. Uh, the, um, the, the other piece is uh, that all of the neighboring, and I think I'm correct, that the neighboring counties all have turf fields, and one of the uh, most prominent systems is Anne Arundel, where our superintendent may have been successful. I think he was successful, but he will speak to that but um, uh, in getting turf fields in, in the high schools there. And, and I know Dr. Maxwell will probably want to uh, 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 deal with that. Um, I, I think that we have issues of health and safety and, um, and we have um, a suggestion on how we could address health and safety on our fields without using, uh, Without we would not agree if we used our own operating money, our own our own money. Uh, but here's a suggestion on how we can get turf fields and get he uh, safe fields for our for our children in the high schools, and not have to have that come out of our budget. I I, I can't uh, uh, understand that piece either. Uh, and the argument that we have used um, regarding uh, our desire to have the turf fields. Uh, but we should identify which schools should, should get them in the order, and I, and I certainly agree with that. You work out some kind of arrangement with that. Uh, and, uh, but we can't afford, and you don't have the issue of cost, or that you can't determine when the fields, which fields would be covered. So I have a, I have a concern, that, uh, I'm trying to understand why we don't want to support this bill. I don't understand it. That's, that's probably the biggest piece. And also, I, I wonder what kind of signal is it to the public uh, when we have our legislators expressing concern about safety in our schools and we take a position that we have, we disagree or we have no position. I don't understand that either. So I have some concerns about um, uh, the position that we're taking today relative to the turf fields when we've set the parameters under which we will accept the offer, our offer, <laughs> and we still don't want it. I, I, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding that piece. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go, yeah, I'll, I, I, I'll go next and I'll start with a question. Um, uh, and that is uh, in my discussion about, and there was a discussion about cost per field. I want to get clarity on that on several levels. One, how much it costs per field to put a turf field in, how much it costs if you added lights, which is not in this, this bill, is but it's not in this bill, but mm -hmm. which in most cases either. comes with well, it. You don't, you uh, don't. And then if you really, if you really added things like new bleachers and that kind of thing, which is well the discussion. So if I could just get a sense. Because uh, I, 20 million wasn't what I recalled the number to be. Uh, uh, Dr. Eubanks, uh, you or Sarah is also there. Uh, you are. Uh, Who's first? Okay. Good evening. Um, we did a little bit of research as the bill came up, and the sort of minimal cost, if all the other infrastructure is in place and the site works under a different contract as it was at Oxon Hill High School. Um, was $600,000, but looking at the two other high schools where we have turf fields in progress, um, WISE, $1.5 million, including the lights, uh, Gwynn Park, $1.7 million, including mm -hmm. the lights, uh, Gwynn Park costing more because there was more site work to be done, um, the overall area was in rougher shape and had drainage problems. And the 1.7 isn't getting us fencing and some of the other things we'd really like to do um, to make sure that the whole facility is really up to a standard. So, um, so that's sort of a range of cost, I think, that you can take into consideration. Thank you. And, and so, and, and then the other part, so I'm clear um, that um, we, uh, the committee's recommendation to support with amendments means 
that we're going to ask to make amendments. If those amendments are not made, what then would be our position? Would it? Yeah, I think it would be opposition. It would be opposition. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'll go on with the speaking. I, I'll just say for myself, I've uh, uh, in committee, I've always felt comfortable with no position. I think there's a lot of questions on this, but I'm going to, but I'm uh, support the fact that uh, uh, we have these amendments, uh, and uh, and so uh, I would support uh, the committee's recommendation on this particular issue. Uh, any other round ones? Ms. Mundy I have is round one, and then Dr. Kaufman and Ms. Jacobs in round two. Oh, sorry. <laughs> add, I thought that oh. that was covered that. Do you have something to add, Dr. Maxwell? My apologies. Well, my, my name was used in a couple of the testimonies. I just thought perhaps <laughs> you'd like you. to, to uh, have me respond to that. I, I thought I was sort of being asked to, but, but, um, but I, I, would, uh, I would say, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to support with amendment, but the amendments are really, really important. Without amendments, I mean, that's what, it, to me, that's what this means. With amendment, without the amendments, this is a non-starter for me. But let me really clarify, Anne Arundel County, and what we've said in every conversation we've had, and I will begin that conversation with saying I have a lot of respect for Senator Miller, Senator, Pil Senator Peters, and Chairman Walker. But what we did in Anne Arundel County uh, with putting a, an artificial turf field at every hill in Anne Arundel County. We did without state legislation. It is not necessary. It is not required. We've said that in every conversation that we've had. That, that's one. Two, the school system didn't pay one penny. They wouldn't have happened if the school system had to pay one, pay one penny. So whether $20 million is, a, is a, a lot or a little in the operating budget, it doesn't need to go to turf fields. But the other things, the lights and other things are really, really important to getting the, the use out of them because when the sun goes down, as it does a good portion of the year, pretty early uh, after school is out, you don't get the use out of the fields to make it really viable or useful. The agreement that we had was the use of open space money and the balance came from records, Rex and Park through the county government in Anne Arundel. That's the structure in Anne Arundel County. And in exchange for the rest of the money from the county, they essentially got another field to use for community use after athletics, practices, uh, varsity and junior varsity athletic events, school functions, uh, and, and the like. All the rest of the time was made available to the community. That's what they got under the memorandum of understanding. You don't need state authorizing legislation to do that. Uh, the bill in a sense, you know, is, is there. I understand it's well-intentioned, it's not necessary, but again, with amendments to make it really clear that the school system is not going to pay for it, then, you know, as long as somebody, that's all I've said all along, we're not gonna pay for it. That's but I just, I just don't really think the bill's actually necessary, but if the board wants to support it with amendment, I mean, I'm okay with that as long as those amendments pass and we are opposed to it without them. Thank you. Ms. Mundy. Thank you, Dr. Eubanks. I just want to also support uh, the committee's work on this effort. Um, I have some students and uh, parents here from Forestville High School who I know is one of the high schools in District 7 that is in desperate need of turf fields. Um, I know that the discussion about turf fields is one that has been controversial, and as my colleague uh, Virginia said and stated it's not one or the other. We all are here to advance academic achievement. That's not a question about what the board's work is here. But I think that as we talk about um, the total child and the, the children's experience in their uh, education and in the schools, this is just one issue that we can augment and make sure that they, are, um, they have the best facility in this effort. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to round two. Uh, Dr. Kaufman. Sure, yeah, first I just, again, I just wanted to repeat what I said at the beginning, which was that uh, I absolutely believe that the, the, you know, I think the bill is well-intentioned. I think the committee certainly did its due diligence, and, and, and I think the amendments certainly made this bill better, and of course I would much prefer the bill with the amendments that were added than, than as it's, than as it's uh, currently written. Um, but I wanted to just address a couple comments that were made by my colleagues. I think, you know, to Dr. Maxwell's point, 
there's different ways to go about doing this, and one is through state legislation, another is by tackling it as, our, as we as a district see need on a case-by-case -case basis. This bill, even with the amendments, imposes a requirement on the system that we are to replace all the fields, current fields, with turf fields. Um, so it is, the legislature is imposing its will on our district to saying this is something that you must make a priority. I don't believe that, yes, I, I absolutely agree that the budget um, uh, reflects in many ways our priorities, but there's also other ways of sending priorities and sending messages, and one of them is for the legislature to say this is a priority, now go out and do it. Um, I would prefer a case-by-case -case approach. The legislature, we have other bills that are on the, our list tonight that are things that are well-intentioned, uh, financial literacy program, for example, in the schools. Um, who can, you know, oppose the idea of having a financial literacy program in the schools? You know, but is that the best way to go about doing it? MAVE has traditionally opposed um, the legislature imposing requirements on districts for additional uh, curriculum and other things. I'm not saying this is exactly the same thing, but again, it's the legislature is setting the priorities. Should the legislature ever get involved in, in some of the things we do? Absolutely. But I think this is another case of where, from, despite the, the intentions and despite the real needs that are existing in some of our high schools that we should be considering and we should be addressing, particularly around health and safety, um, this, I just don't believe this is the best approach to tackling it. Thank you. Ms. Jacobs. Thank you. You know, <clears throat> um, you know, we really can't pick it. Well, we can't pick and choose if we want to, and that's what we do when we're voting on legislation. Um, and what I mean by that is our state delegation imposes legislation, as we all well know, on this school district often. And we take a position on it. Sometimes we take a position and it passes. Sometimes we take a position and it doesn't pass. Um, Delegate Walker has put this legislation in year after year after year. And maybe he's doing it because year after year after year, the school district says, we'll take a look at it. We'll look into it. Now, I certainly respect Dr. Maxwell that he would do it, but he's had his hands full doing, you know, this year particularly, um, trying to maintain the budget that we do have. And I'm not speaking for him, but I'm just saying, I mean, at the end of the day, there are bills that come from Annapolis that we don't necessarily agree with and that we don't necessarily think they should impose their will on one county. It happens all the time across the state. I think this is one issue where Delegate Walker has put this bill in time and time again, and the board has taken the recommendation of, well, we can't do it because. The other thing that he brought up in his presentation, which I don't think has been explored extensively, was the alternative options for funding. So if we don't ever have the conversation, we won't ever have the conversation. And so I just think that this is, this is the classic bill where, as Dr. Maxwell said, the position is clear. We're not spending operating funds to do this. And if it does say operating funds, then it's clear what our position is. Right. Mr. Burrows. Just to echo the sentiments of the, of the vice chair of the committee, uh, the amendments that the policy committee introduced uh, were an attempt to look out for what was in the best interest of the school system. Once again, we do not support spending our own resources and our own dollars on turf fields, but we understand that our students, we understand and we believe that our students deserve to play on high quality fields. If you go to Anne Arundel, if you go to Charles, if you go to Ballou in Washington, D.C., they, their students are playing on high quality fields. When I go to Crossland, Potomac, and Friendly, more often than not, they can't even play because the gravel's coming up, uh, their dirt patches, you know, students are sp springing their ankles. I mean, it is a matter of public safety. And so uh, I think the committee introduced amendments to look out for the best interests of the board by saying, we cannot afford to do this, but we support the idea. Um, and so with that, Mr. Chair, um, is, is there a motion on the floor? If, and the motion is to support? Oh, he didn't get a second, though. Yes, he did. Oh, he the did. motion on the floor is to okay. oppose. Okay. With that, I, I would uh, call the question and ask my colleagues to vote no to oppose. I think the amendments here protect us and safeguard us, so I would ask my colleagues to vote no. 
Okay. Uh, there's still no, one more speaker on the list, Ms. Boston. I don't need to speak because I was going to call for the motion. Uh, the could you repeat the amendment? I mean the motion. Yes, Mr. Chair. Motion to oppose PG 407 15. Dr. Anderson? No. Mr. Burroughs? No. Ms. Epps? Ms. Eubanks? Ms. Hernandez? No. Ms. Jacobs? Dr. Kaufman. Aye. Ms. Mundy? No. Ms. Quinteros Grady? Aye. Mr. Valentine? No. Ms. Williams? No. Mr. Taylor? Absent. Ms. Boston? No. Dr. Eubanks? No. Three ayes? Okay, that motion fails. Eight. Is there another motion? I'll entertain a motion uh, on our position on turf fields. Mr. Burroughs. Mr. Chair, I move to support the committee's recommendation. Do you have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Motion to support PG 407 15. With amendments. With amendments. Dr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Burroughs? Aye. Ms. Epps? Absent. Ms. Eubanks? Aye. Ms. Hernandez? Aye. Ms. Jacobs? Aye. Dr. Kaufman? No. Ms. Mundy? Yes. Ms. Quinteros Grady? No. Mr. Valentine? Aye. Ms. Williams? Mr. Taylor? Absent. Ms. Boston? Yes. Dr. Eubanks? Yes. 10 ayes, 2 noes. That motion carries. We're moving on to PG 408-15 on certified county-based business participation programs. The committee uh, um, recommended support with amendment. Mr. Burroughs. Mr. Chair, I'd like to urge my colleagues to support this with amendment. Uh, ultimately, when we invest, I mean, this is a, a so move. Well, okay. I move to support. Okay. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, this bill essentially uh, would require us to create a local business uh, policy. Um, at the end of the day, as Dr. Anderson mentioned, our budget, uh, operating budget alone is $1.8 a billion dollars, and our capital budget millions and millions year after year. Uh, and if we invest that money back into our own local economy, our families are stronger, and when our families are stronger, our school system is stronger. And if we can invest that, um, that money back into the county um, with our own businesses, support our own, uh, I think that's the right thing to do. Um, the committee did have a few amendments. Uh, one of those amendments uh, came from Ms. Jacobs, and that was to form a MOU with the county government. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, uh, this is not a us versus them. It's how do we work together to provide as many opportunities as possible for Prince George's County citizens. And I think that uh, amendment, amendment from Ms. Jacobs will help do that. So I'd like to move that we support this and call the roll if there's no discussion. Thank you. We, we, we'll go through the discussion first, though, if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Um, again, I, I support the work the committee has done on this. I think the bill is actually very well intentioned, um, and I actually am not 
you know, disagreeing as an, an ultimate option that this could be a, some, you know, a way that we might want to go. But I do have some questions or concerns about it. Um, one issue is, of course, the political feasibility of putting it to a referendum and whether that's going to something that's, you know, going to pass or not. But I think that's sort of the, Different you know, bit. the least of my options. Um, the, the, or, 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 or concerns on the face of it. And, you know, I'm not a, I don't know the, um, uh, have the figures in front of me about what this impact this this legislation would have on our yeah 41315 the Four, eight, eight, oh I'm sorry we were, I thought we were going to never mind <laughs> <laughs> I should have been listening to you <laughs> anyway I was getting a lot of funny looks okay. and the, Come on, guys. Let me say my piece. Never mind. Yeah, <laughs> save, save all that. No discussion. All right. So let me go back to where we are. 40815. Is there any further discussion on 40815? Hearing none, please call the roll. Motion to support with amendments, PG 40815. Dr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Burroughs? Aye. Ms. Epps? Absent. Ms. Eubanks? Aye. Ms. Hernandez? Aye. Ms. Jacobs? Aye. Dr. Kaufman? Aye. Ms. Mundy? Aye. Ms. Quinteros Grady? Aye. Mr. Valentine? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Absent. Ms. Boston? Aye. Dr. Eubanks? Aye. 12 ayes. Thank you. The motion carries. We're now on to PG 413 15, uh, which is New School Construction Investment Act of 2015. The uh, committee. There are oh, isn't there one? No. Now, on now it's your one? turn to, to mess up. I don't want to talk about that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> PG. <laughs> PG 412-15 alternative to suspension pilot program establishment the committee recommended opposition do I have a motion Ms. Jacobs thank you Dr. Eubanks um, on behalf of the committee we move to oppose PG 412-15 is there a second 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 it has been moved and seconded is there any discussion yes who said yes Ms. Jacobs yes. <laughs> well, I, I didn't want to get ahead of myself with the motion without a second. Um, I just wanted to, I think this is, is it's critical to point out that I think the intent here that Delegate Washington has is clear, that we have alternatives to school suspension and that kids not be um, <clears throat> placed in a position where they're just out of school with nothing to do. And that is well-intentioned. The reason why the committee, um, part of our discussion in terms of opposing the bill, um, actually goes to something my colleague um, Mr. Kaufman said, which is we don't need it um, in this particular case. And what, um, you know, I think it's, it's prudent maybe that we can meet with Delegate, and I know you've met with him, but if we can have some further uh, discussion with him to get to the intent of what he ultimately wants. And I think what he ultimately wants, we can do. Yeah. Not to mention that MSDE has, has now become um, a leading board, state board in the nation for the position that it has taken relative to uh, uh, school suspensions. Mm -hmm. And that being the case, the new regulations are very clear about how, and, uh, how, how students are suspended and the reasons for which they would be suspended. So I think that we can accomplish what Delegate Washington wants to see happen with kids. Um, I know the administration has been talking a lot about alternative options for students. And so I think that that has to be built into the academic um, piece of our work. And so for that reason, um, we support the intent of the bill, but we don't think it's necessary. Mr. Burroughs. Uh, I see no one else but none. Uh, and so would you please uh, restate the motion and call the roll. Motion to oppose PG for 1215. Dr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Burroughs? Aye. Ms. Epps? Absent. Ms. Eubanks? Aye. 
Ms. Hernandez? Aye. Ms. Jacobs? Aye. Dr. Kaufman? Aye. Ms. Mundy? Aye. Ms. Quinteros Grady? Aye. Mr. Valentine? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Absent. Ms. Boston? Aye. Dr. Eubanks? Aye. 12 ayes. Thank you. That motion carries. We are now on to, make sure I get this right, P PG, <laughs> PG 413-15, New School Construction Investment Act of 2015. I'll entertain motions, Mr. Kaufman, Dr. Kaufman. I would move to take um, no position on this one. Do you have a second? Move for no position. Discussion. Mr. Burroughs. I was going to make a motion for it. Oh. So the, the motion is for to take a no position on this. You want to, is there a debate, discussion? Ms. Dr. Kaufman. Sure. I'm sorry for being trigger happy uh, earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, as I was starting to say, I think that, again, this is a really well intentioned bill. Um, and I certainly, as much as anybody here supports, as I said even on Tuesday, us looking for alternative sources for funding, whether they come from the county or creative financing, we all want to get as much um, support as we can. Um, we know there's so many priorities that we can't meet. Um, but my concern is more practical in this case. I mean, as I said, one issue is political feasibility. Is this uh, a road that, um, you know, is, is likely to result in, in, in passage of the legislation? But beyond that, um, you know, questions about the impact on local residents and local businesses, and I just don't know if we fully really, uh, really explored that. One is, you know, sales tax, uh, the, it was increased statewide, I think back in 2007. Uh, we know there was just an election where there was a lot of um, uh, pushback uh, among, among voters regarding, regarding taxes, even in, you know, even among uh, um, some of us who, who uh, may have voted not, you know, for the for the winning for the winning candidate at the governor's level, but um, you know, sales tax is a very regressive tax. Um, we have a uh, county residents who have a lot of needs, um, and so that's that's one concern. Um, another concern is about the impact on county business. So we increased the one percent sales tax here um, beyond the impact that that might have on 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 um, residents. Um, you know, I don't know what the projections are in terms of what, you know, what residents will do. Will they cross county lines and, and spend their dollars elsewhere? Is that a possible unintended consequence of this bill? Um, I don't know, and it may not be, but I'm not sure we've done our full diligence on this, on this issue. Um, and then I think, you know, just the bigger question of, um, and I guess this is a similar point of what I was making with the last bill, that I think there's, um, uh, again, however well-intentioned this bill is, there's a lot of different alternatives that we can look at, um, and I, I certainly think this can be one option that we would put on the table, but I think there's other options um, um, uh, that we can look at in terms of existing county revenue, as well as some of the creative you know, financing options that I mentioned last uh, on Tuesday as well, and, and other alternatives that may not have been put on the table. And I would love to see a more comprehensive discussion, and not just within this board, but actually with our county stakeholders and our state delegation to put out there and say, okay, what are the, you know, what are the options that we have here and, and, work, and, and what can we do through the legislature? What can we do? Because certainly the legislature has a big responsibility here. What is the county council's responsibility and what, is, uh, what are other ideas that we, can, that we can put out there that potentially a private funding or other funding could, could support? So I would, again, that's why I'm moving to, to put this in no position. Again, it's nothing against the intent or the work of the committee. It's really just about uh, you know, some questions and concerns about whether this is the, you know, the, 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 the main avenue that we should be pursuing and whether it should be going through the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Anderson. I understand the arguments. I, I do. Uh, and, and I don't think any of us are interested in additional taxes. Uh, but we have something called TRIM. And uh, in our county, we just don't seem to get as much from our property taxes as other counties. Our county contribution is less than the county contributions in neighboring counties. 
And we've got a $2 billion bill fa uh, uh, in front of us in the very near future um, because our schools are crumbling. So the question is, how do we get the money? And I wish, we, I, I think that we should engage in some dialogue. We need dialogue because we need to get $2 billion and we can't afford it and we're not going to get it th through CIP uh, unless we're willing to wait 40 years. Our, our schools will not last that long. So while I feel that, um, uh, you know, that, that, that this, this uh, idea uh, deserves a lot of attention and a lot of interactions with our community uh, in order to identify a new stream, an additional stream of money. I think this, uh, uh, that the, uh, the bill is, uh, or the um, uh, uh, PG uh, uh, 413, 15, is providing an avenue where we can get, not all of the money, but we can get some of the money so that we could start getting our schools constructed or renovated. And so for that reason, I'd, I'd wanna support uh, uh, the bill. For those reasons, I'd wanna support the bill. Thank you. We have Ms. Jacobs, myself, and then Mr. Burroughs. Ms. Jacobs. Thank you. Um, I would say that the number one reason I would support this bill is that citizens get to decide. It's not a tax that's imposed on us. It's something that citizens can make a informed decision about. So my, my thoughts are that, you know, how many times do we have constituents at every single board meeting come to us and say, my school was built in 1950 or 1940 or whatever. I think the latest data says that in the state of Maryland, all schools in this state were built, not all, most schools, um, I think it's 40% were built prior to 1980. That says something about the condition of buildings in our state. <coughs> and so I think why this is important again for me is because citizens get to decide. It's a referendum bill. Um, I can respect that we have um, the challenges that we do. We know in Prince George's alone we have at least $2.1 billion in need. And the state doesn't have the money, hasn't come up with a new process for how they're gonna support it. And in our state constitution, if I'm not mistaken, this is one state where we rely solely on our state legislature for funds for construction. Mm -hmm. And in other states, that's not always the case. So that sole reliability on the state to bring us back less, not even 50%, I don't think, I, I can't remember the percentage at this point in terms of what we actually get compared to what we ask for. Um, the bottom line is, I, the reason I support this is because citizens get to decide. And, and when you make a case to our citizens and let them decide, I think, we get the best result. So first, let me ask a couple of questions for clarification. Let me start with this last one. Explain our, the percentage of funding between local and state revenues for construction. So, so typically in the last few years, uh, the county has been, con I mean the state has been contributing somewhere between 25 and $40 million a year and the county has been contributing about an average of about $100 million a year. Uh, can, I, can I go on from there or do you want me to? Or no, no. I, I answered your question. Right, I right. That does it. I'm happy to make other comments if you like. So my other question, uh, 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 maybe this is a uh, few minutes, Tobias. Yes. Um, have you talked to colleagues in the county so council and the county executive and others and what's, the have they taken though. a position on this bill? Yes, sir. The, the county executive's office is going to be opposing the bill. And the county council, um, last I heard, was holding. They had not uh, made an official vote on it. But there, the general um, consensus is that this is a very bad time to be raising taxes. Um, and they're concerned uh, in part because of some of the uh, concerns that were raised um, in comments earlier, I believe, by Dr. Kaufman about the effect that this would have on the citizens. So they have not made an official vote. But I, I believe that the inclination is, is towards to not support Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, I share some concerns. I express them uh, uh, at policy committee uh, that uh, that are numerous, not not the least of which is those those folks who are kind of responsible for helping to get those revenues um, uh, are having issues with this as well. Um, I actually, for that, for one of the reasons that I'm concerned is the fact that this is uh, put up for a referendum. Uh, we are in uh, a battle for 
to make this a great public school system. And we know we have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. I believe at some point we're going to, uh, we might need to come to our citizens and say, we have a plan, we've proven to you that we're on the right track, and we need your support. Uh, and when that time comes, we need to be ready and we better have a plan. This doesn't represent it to me. This represents something that seems to me to be uh, instead kind of relatively random uh, and not right. part of a plan that we've been involved in, uh, in creating. Uh, so, uh, so that uh, concerns me. That said, again, uh, given um, uh, our need, it's why um, I would uh, support the idea of, uh, of not taking a position uh, because, again, if it passes, then uh, it's not that it could hurt. The other thing I'm concerned about is even if we, um, uh, even if this passed, um, I'd be very curious, particularly in our current political circumstances, about what might happen to our state funding if all of a sudden the percentage of our local funding went up and whether or not the state would happily just keep going, doing what they're doing and give us more and more, or whether they'd see this as an opportunity uh, to save a few bucks. Uh, so I want to keep more pressure on our state <coughs> government to give us what we so rightfully deserve um, and not ask our citizens uh, to give what the state should rightfully be giving for us. So for that reason, um, I support the motion for, uh, for no position. Mr. Burroughs. Um, I want to thank the committee once again for um, their work. Um, you know, I can live with no position. I think ultimately uh, we have to do something. You know, um, every day that I'm in a school, half the school's too hot, the other half's too cold. Uh, you have students wearing jackets in the middle of the day because the bowl is broken or something's wrong. Our fills are not safe. Uh, uh, and, and, at the end of the day, at least in District 8, we would appreciate um, everywhere, but uh, we would appreciate the additional dollars. And I think what the, the sponsor of this bill was trying to do is to do something. I mean, we can't year after year hope and beg for more money and expect for it to come because it's not. You know, you know, it 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 hasn't. You know, there is no plan. And so I would hope that we meet with the sponsor of this bill. Uh, and you know the county executive, the county council to figure out how do we get on the same page about uh, a unified approach to advocating for, for funding for our, for our students um, because across the system our schools are not in the best position. And next door, Washington DC, if they're able to do it, we should be able to do it. If Baltimore City is able to do it, we should be able to do it. And I think the intent of the sponsor here is to do something because our, our, our buildings are, for the most part, uh, in horrible condition. Um, and it is important that we have environments conducive to learning. And if we want to have a world-class school system, we must have the facilities to back that up. And that's what the sponsor of this bill was trying to do. Thank you. Ms. Boston. I'm calling for a question. All right. Called I have one more person in the queue, Ms. Jacobs. You want to go? Or you? Yeah, I'll make it quick. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, request to get the breakdown of county funding for projects. I know the county has an obligation under the under the pro provisions to provide funding, whether it's in preparation for construction, et cetera, et cetera. But I'd like to see the breakdown um, specifically for individual projects where the county does more than the state. And with that, um, I had one other thing, but I can't remember now. So. Thank you. The question's been called. Could you please uh, repeat uh, the motion and, uh, and uh, call the roll? Motion to take no position on PG 413-15. Dr. Anderson? No. Mr. Burroughs? No. Ms. Epps, absent. Ms. Eubanks? Yes. Ms. Hernandez? Yes. Ms. Jacobs? No. Dr. Kaufman? Aye. Ms. Mundy? Yes. 
Ms. Quinteros Grady. Abstain. Mr. Valentine. Aye. Ms. Williams. Yes. Mr. Taylor. Is absent. Ms. Boston. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes. Dr. Eubanks. Yes. Eight ayes, three nays. Thank you, that motion carries. Our last, hope, I believe this is the last one. Uh, which is HB 197, SB 295, uh, which is uh, Youth Wellness Leadership Pilot Program. The, most, the, the recommendation of the committee is to support with amendment. Mr. Burroughs. Mr. Chair, I move to accept the recommendation from the committee to support with amendment. May I have a second? It's been moved and seconded to support HB 197 with amendment. Is there any discussion? Will speak to your motion you, you, or you're okay? There's no discussion. All right. I see no discussion. Would you please call the roll? Motion to support with amendments HB 197, Youth Wellness Leadership Pilot Program. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Yeah, uh, aye. Mr. Burroughs? Aye. Ms. Epps? Absent. Ms. Eubanks? Aye. Ms. Hernandez? Aye. Ms. Jacobs? Yes. Dr. Kaufman? Aye. Ms. Mundy? Yes. Ms. Quinteros Grady? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Absent. <clears throat> Ms. Boston? Aye. Dr. Eubanks? Aye. 12 eyes. Thank you. That motion carries. Um, and uh, that concludes the votes we need to take. You got any other thing else briefly to wrap us up? I have nothing else. Okay, thank you. Keep up the good work <laughs> in Annapolis. <laughs> All right, thank you, folks. Um, you know, in, during a lot of the course of the year, um, when we don't have legislative items, we get right to the public speaking. Um, so this this time the public got to see I got to see some stuff tonight. Y'all don't usually get to see that. So you're welcome thank you for sticking around. <laughs> I said you're welcome. So we are on to uh, our public comment on non-agenda items. Uh, before we begin, I just remind folks you've been registered to speak in public comment forum where the Board of Education will listen to your comments, but will not address your comments. All registered speakers have three minutes to make your presentation at the sound of the buzzer. Please do your best to finish that last sentence only. Uh, we ask that you refrain from kind of speaking to folks uh, directly. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, as always, that, that uh, you refrain from using profanatory or other derogatory terms. Um, and at that, uh, let's get started and start to uh, hear from from our public. The first speaker we have registered to speak this evening is Bobby Barbie. Good evening. Thank you for letting me uh, address you and uh, with the uh, to speak to you all on behalf of uh, the bus drivers and the bus attendants. My name is Bobby Barbie. I've been working for PG County System for over 14 years. I am, I do work at Mullican Bus Lot. The concern thing for the bus attendants and the bus drivers coming to work, we love working and driving for PG County. There are drivers and bus attendants that have been working in PG County for over 20 and 40 some years. On a daily basis, we have experienced the following issues while doing our duties. Students are throwing things at drivers. Mm -hmm. For instance, a student had thrown shoes and hit a driver in the head while oh. she was driving. Mm -hmm. Students are having performing racial marks, spitting mm -hmm. and driving spitting on drivers and attendants because the drivers have written them up. Students have gotten physical with drivers and attendants every day. This has to stop. Pre uh, 
um, parents and things have gotten physical with drivers and attendants. For instance, a driver had been choked by a, by a parent because of writing up a, a student. There is too much violence on drivers and attendants that is not fair and safe in, in doing our job and working. Students have to students have to come to an understanding that we are not here to be headed all news for fanity or anything else. As, as the, I, we are asking the Board of Education, the Superintendent of Schools, the Department of Transportation to help us to, with the kids on the school buses. The, code of, the student code of ethics have to be changed and make it tougher for the kids and things that are violate our rights. I have asked, I'm asking that Prince George's County uh, work together with us as drivers and bus attendants. We love working and driving for the school system. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Frederick Holt. Good evening. Good evening. Great by choice. Great by choice. <laughs> now I've heard a, a lot of uh, testimony concerning money. This is a large school system and it requires a lot of money to run it. In business, if you would like to have more money to do the things that you need to do, one must first learn how to reduce their liabilities. You can reduce your liabilities by developing uh, effective leadership development program. Now, in my hand, I hold a booklet. At the beginning of each year, if each school administrator had a copy of this booklet and was skilled in how to apply it, we could reduce our discipline and increase our academic achievement, guaranteed. Now, Dr. Maxwell, I'm not speaking to him, but he would probably know about this booklet because he is a member of the organization that makes this uh, booklet available. And that organization is the American Association of School Administrators. The title of this book, i hold it up. And don't let the date frighten you. It's 1980. <laughs> and it says, Student Discipline, Problems, and Solutions. There's nothing new under the sun concerning disciplines and how to solve the problem. The American Association of School Administrators make all of this available to anyone who is a member. I am a member, and I'm certain that the superintendent is a member. He has a wonderful photograph in the 150-year uh, <laughs> edition, and Pass it looking around. good. But here is the document. I'm short on time. Anyone want to um, review it? No problem. Now, and I said, read Great by Choice by Jim Collins. The most significant page in this publication is page 56. And there are three statements that stand out. One, don't even think about playing a name game when students aren't learning. Have the strength to look at the problem and take responsibility. Right. The second point, don't think the solution is out there. If the students aren't learning, the school needs to change. Next point and last on that, no one is allowed to lag behind if every student in every classroom isn't learning. The school isn't doing its job. Read the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership by John Maxwell. Casual Friday. When we choose to honor Casual Friday, we signal to our students that teaching and learning is not valued the same 
as the other days of the week. And so, who wants the copy? <laughs> Other side, she wants the copies. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much, okay. Mr. Holt. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah Woodbury, Suitland High School PTSA. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I understand the enormity of your responsibilities and the magnitude of what you do as a board and it does not go unnoticed. My name is Deborah Woodbury and I'm a parent at, of a freshman at Suitland High School and a very proud member of the PTSA. I'm here to speak to you on behalf of the PTSA and I would like to first recognize a few members and partners of Suitland High School, Len Monday, Mr. Valentine, as well as Dr. Eubanks. We are here today to make two requests of the board and which we believe are very necessary and can be very easily resolved. First, we're requesting that the board immediately provide us with two additional full-time security personnel to make Suitland High School a safe haven and a campus and the campus that it should be. Many of you may recall the incident that took place in this past November wherein a student was severely beaten and another student was suffered major injuries and was sent to the hospital. And as a result, we ended up canceling our normal PTSA meeting to address the issues and concerns with parents, administrators, and the local community. The incident was very unfortunate and absolutely unnecessary, but it was not and is not representative of the 1,900 students at Suitland High School. The incident caused a flood of media coverage, negative social, social media rumors, and obviously concerns among parents who entrust their children to Suitland and ultimately to this very board. Suitland High School is a very unique environment. It's a, it has a very large main campus that is not a typical rectangular shaped structure, including the many long corridors and stairwells. This combined with the wooded areas adjacent to the school as well as the annex at the back of the property makes proper securing the entire school very difficult. Securing the building is made virtually impossible with the eight full-time security officers currently assigned at the school. Our security team is doing a very good job, but with 1,900 students and the complexity of the design of this large campus, the existing security is insufficient. There is one security guard for every 238 students, and we're asking you, the board, to immediately provide us with two additional full-time security personnel to secure our school. There was a study done by the NYU Graduate School of Public Service that says <laughs> a safe haven is a prerequisite for productive learning. And next, we, <coughs> we would like to request field lighting, and I thank you for the discussion earlier, at the Suitland High School athletic field. External, external lighting is such a simple <laughs> pleasure that exists at many of the other high schools, but Suitland, our track field is without lights. <coughs> Accordingly, the sports team are left with two choices, one of two choices. They reduce practice times, which isn't fair to our students, or they practice <coughs> with very little light, which is unsafe. Our dedicated and committed coaches follow behind runners and their personal vehicles to light up the path outside the track in the dark. And some of, sometimes practice is held inside. And I did hear Dr. Uh, Kaufman say, mentioned earlier, <coughs> how bad running on cement is on your body. And school, the school floors inside are not made for track running. And these floors are sometimes slippery. <coughs> the safety and security of our students is priority one. Please help us improve our conditions at Suitland so that we can be great by choice. Our parents, our students deserve it, and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Fan Phone Christopher Kenmore Elementary School PTA. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Fan Sean Christopher, and I am here representing the parent, teachers, and student of Kenmore, Kenmore Elementary School as a parent and the current PTA president. Kenmore Elementary School has provided outstanding education to students, thousands of students over the last 40 plus years. The students and staff are committed to everyone every day. Excuse me. The students at Kenmore have excelled every year and show it with their grades and commitment to studying and staying on the track to excellence. The test scores at Kenmore are consistently high. The staff has proven itself committed to teaching and helping students grow every day. In October of 2014, I was informed that the Board of Education was looking to change the program at Kenmore Elementary. As a parent of a successful student, I was dismayed to hear this. As the current PTA president, I was wondering why I make changes to a school that is committed to teaching and achieving high scores year after year. After speaking to fellow parents and holding a meeting informing parents of the changes, 
I learned that they felt the same way as me. Then a letter came home to us during winter break, and most of my parents were discouraged about the possibility of Kenmore staying. The letter made it seem like the board had made its decision already, and that Kenmore was going to change no matter how many parents spoke up against the change. This caused most of my parents to say to me, it does not matter, they've already made up their minds and they're not going to listen to us. This was very discouraging to me. To be made to feel like our voices and opinions do not matter even though it is us that vote to place people on the board that are supposed to have our children's best interests in mind. To me as a parent, it does not seem that the best interest for my child is to place him in a school that does not test as high as the school he's currently in. It is not the best interest of my child to place him in a school that might have the same issue of being closed to consist due to consistently low test scores and then having to shuffle him again should this happen. You, the board, are responsible for making sure the current and future students get the best education possible. Should a school that has proven itself to being successful in teaching our future leaders be changed? Should another school whose test scores are not as high as the others be overcrowded when there are other buildings not in use that could be properly used for the ECC program? Should parents be made to feel like they cannot fight for what is right for their children and their voices are not being heard? We the parents, teachers, and students of Kimmer Elementary School urge you to reconsider changing a great school. We ask you please consider the impact on present and future students changing this excellent school of learning would have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mark King. Good evening. Um, Good evening. I represent uh, Forestville High School, and I'm here this evening to uh, so once again to solicit your support. Um, I have with me tonight um, members of our family, our community. Uh, if you would please stand. Okay, we're here. To, we're here tonight to let you know that we're dead serious. We support and we want Forest Bill to return and be, once again become a military academy. Um, on January 29th of this year, a teacher was assaulted at Forestville High School. That would not have occurred at Forestville Military Academy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes uh, our public uh, comment on non-agenda items. Uh, as always, uh, citizens, thank you so much for, uh, for being here and having your voices heard. Uh, it means a tremendous amount to us. Uh, we do uh, listen to you carefully. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, what I would like, uh, I'd like to propose, uh, given the time, um, a propose or offer uh, a recommendation because I think that at some point um, at nine o'clock we may uh, lose quorum at some point. Um, so we have two items uh, on, uh, on discussion um, and the, uh, what, given that one of them is tied directly to a second reader item, uh, I may recommend that we take the discussion on boundaries uh, first and go to governance uh, and once we're done with that process if we still have quorum to go back to systems oversight. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Ms. Jacobs, I did not see your buzzer. Was that in that Actually, same? now that you're moving it up, I can wait until. Okay. All right. Um, so is there objection to that? Let me say I know, colleagues, in, in fact, this might, uh, it might be the second time that the Division of Supporting Services, is this, is this have we moved them once already? No. Okay. No. Other than okay. other than from today to tonight, they okay. haven't been moved, All right. sir. All right. So we and 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 I'm not saying we we won't get to them if we have quorum, we will stay for for both. But I want to make sure since one of them is tied to an action item, are you okay with that, Dr. Maxwell? Thank you, everyone. Board, is the board okay with that so that we can keep quorum? All right. So that's what we would do. We would then. 
um, skip item 4.1 for now and go on to discussion item 4.2 and I yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell for an introduction of discussion item 4.2. Thank you Dr. Eubanks. I'm actually going to turn it over to my wonderful outstanding Chief Operating Officer Monica Goles. Good evening. <clears throat> Mr. John Dell Jones Brown, the Director of Pupil Accounting and School Boundaries, will provide a brief presentation representing the recommended boundary, grade, and program improvements that will begin in the fall of 2015. In addition, he'll provide a summary of public comments that were received in, on October 20th and 21st. <clears throat> he will summarize comments received from October 21st through December 7th, as well as summarize comments received from the public hearing that was held on January 28th. Without further ado, I will present Mr. John Dale Jones Brown. Thank you and good evening. This past October, a series of public forums were held where we invited the public's input on a number of matters that were under consideration regarding uh, school changes in school boundaries, programs, and grade structure. Questions specifically uh, that were discussed was the potential closure of Thomas Claggett Elementary School and the conversion of Kenmore Elementary into a uh, early childhood center. We also discussed at that time a uh, change in two schools, sixth grade, sending them to a middle school, as well as the adjustment in the boundaries for the uh, ESOP program. There were also a couple of minor boundary changes affecting less than 10 children uh, that were introduced as possibilities. What we specifically asked was input to uh, the CEO's consideration of these questions for alternatives to be considered as well as the community's overall um, reaction to those. At the first public hearing, excuse me, at the first public forum, which was held on the 21st of October at Thomas Claggett Elementary, uh, approximately 50 individuals were in attendance. Uh, the, those in attendance were overwhelmingly representing the Thomas Clagg community and identified um, and commented primarily about the closure, the proposed closure of that school. Again, as background, Thomas Claggart had been identified as a low performing school and the district had been asked by uh, Maryland State Department of Education to specifically address them, laying out several alternatives including the possible closure or restructuring of the school. Uh, the, question that we were pondering at the time was a recommendation of possible closure because of its low enrollment in addition to its lagging performance. The parents in general accepted the logic of possibly closing the school and reassigning the students to John Bain and District Heights <coughs> Elementary Schools, both of which are within walking distance of those uh, schools, of the, of the uh, Thomas Claggett. Again, I apologize. Again, on the uh, hearing that was held on the uh, 21st, again, approximately 50 individuals in attendance, again, representing Thomas Claggett primarily. Again, the logic of reassigning the students to the next uh, adjacent schools was generally accepted. All those parents did accept an interest in applying for transfers to other schools. Again, that possibility would be available to them. Uh, several parents in attendance also expressed concern regarding uh, expanding the um, uh, Hyattsville Middle uh, School Creative and Performing Arts to the sixth grade. That is not a proposal that has been forwarded at this time. That um, particular item uh, was not included in the CEO's recommendations. On the 22nd of October, another public hearing was, uh, public forum was held. This one was held at Kenmore Elementary, uh, excuse me, Kenmore Middle School. Uh, there were approximately uh, 100 individuals that were in attendance at that public forum. Again, a substantial number of those in attendance were representing the Kenmore Elementary School community and voiced uh, significant opposition to the recommendation for the con con closure of the school or its conversion to an early childhood center. They did ask that we consider alternatives including possibly co-locating 
and Early Childhood Center and with Kenmore Elementary. They also expressed, again, strong, strong support for the um, academic leadership in the school, the principal and the teachers, indicating they felt great amount of confidence in regards to uh, that leadership and the education that their children were receiving. There was also some concern ex expressed about possible uh, capital improvements which might be needed if the neighborhood population were removed and the facility was converted to an early childhood center. And uh, a couple of individuals also expressed concern regarding, um, again, the expansion, uh, possible expansion of Hydesville Middle School Creative and Performing Arts Program to the sixth grade. Again, that was an item for discussion but was not adopted as part of the, recomm the CEO's recommendations to you. There was also an individual representing the Echo Creek Academy that expressed concern about the growing school enrollment and anticipated overcrowding at that location. Those two public forums were followed with, again, a re-examination of the, of the options that were available, and the CEO formulated a number of recommendations that are now before you. Uh, this past week, a uh, public, uh, formal public hearing was held where public comment on those recommendations were solicited. The specific recommendations include, again, the closure of Thomas Claggett Elementary, the, clo the conversion of Kenmore Elementary School to an early childhood center, the movement of sixth grade middle school, uh, sixth grade to middle schools. Uh, again, this would be from Woodmore Elementary as well as from William Paca Elementary Schools. Mm -hmm a number of minor boundary change and, and adjustments to administrative boundaries for the Early Childhood Center and for the uh, English as a second language uh, for Potomac High School students. The closure of Thomas Claggett, again, as I mentioned, was engendered by two primary factors coming together, one in terms of the concerns over the school's performance, which had been uh, expressed not only within the district here but also at the uh, state level and also the continued low enrollment of Thomas Claggett Elementary School. Thomas Claggett currently uh, has approximately 230 students uh, and is the second, excuse me, the sixth smallest elementary school in the district. There is an early childhood um, parent infant program for deaf and hard of hearing uh, children that is at Thomas Claggett, Claggett Elementary, and that program could be accommodated and would be accommodated at Kingsford Elementary without any changes for, uh, uh, in the capital structure of the uh, program. The students currently assigned to Thomas Claggett would be reassigned to two schools that are within walking distance of their homes. Approximately 60 students would be reassigned to um, uh, District Heights and 130 students to uh, John Bain Elementary Schools. Both schools have sufficient room to accommodate the students without overcrowding. There you see a numeric summary of the before and after picture for the uh, schools. Again, I would point out uh, that Thomas Claggett currently is operating uh, with uh, just under, uh, at 50% of its state rated capacity. I should mention that with the closure of Thomas Claggett Elementary, the building would remain in the district's inventory and would be used for administrative purposes. The feeder pattern would be largely unaffected. Uh, however, the, uh, there would be a reassignment of students to Drew Freeman Middle School. The early child, one of the pressing issues that uh, motivated the uh, recommendation regards to Kenmore is a pressing need for an early childhood center. Again, right now we operate early childhood centers at Francis Fuchs as well as um, H.W. Winship Wheatley, um, both of which are operating at substantially over their existing capacity. The recommendation would repurpose Kenmore Elementary into an early childhood center. The current school population at Kenmore would be reassigned and could be completely absorbed by uh, William Paca Elementary School. And again, a new early childhood center would open at Kenmore. 
in order to ensure that there is adequate room at William Paker. The sixth grade at William Paker would be reassigned to the middle school, uh, Kenmore Middle. Again, in terms of establishing a new early childhood center, relief to the existing early childhood centers was one of the primary motivations, as well as the accessibility of that uh, facility to um, non-disabled peers, as well as to other parents that would be utilizing that service. One of the benefits in terms of keeping it in operation as an early childhood center is that there would not be a vacant building, um, which would potentially be a detriment to the community in that area. Again, at Francis Fuchs Early Childhood Center and Winch H. Winship Wheatley Early Childhood Center, between the two of them, there are approximately 30 temporary buildings that are in use. And again, the addition of the 28 classrooms, uh, 22 classrooms rather, at Kenmore Elementary would be a tremendous benefit in terms of reducing, although not completely eliminating, the overcrowding at those two early childhood centers. <coughs> Again, the positioning of Kenmore Elementary is also advantageous from a geographic standpoint and as far as it lies between those two early childhood centers and thus makes the realigning the boundaries, again, uh, somewhat easier in terms of reducing travel time for the children that would be uh, bused to that location. <coughs> again, in the uh, slide here, I'm showing the before and after circumstances for the schools. Again, you'll note that Kenmore Elementary School is currently operating at approximately 55% of its state rated capacity. Its enrollment as of September 30th was approximately 223 students, which made it the second lowest uh, enrollment for an elementary school in Prince George's County. Again, the um, William Peca Elementary School was also underutilized at 69%, and reassigning the Kenmore population to William Peca would boost its enrollment and thus remove two underutilized schools uh, from the uh, school's list of operating schools. Again, there is uh, additional students that would be reassigned to Kenmore Middle School, which does have some modest effect in terms of overcrowding. Uh, but again, given the uh, facility there, uh, we've been assured that the uh, impact would not be substantial on the school's operation. In regards to moving the sixth grade to middle school, there are two very modest proposals that are before you. One of them is associated with the movement of Kenmore Elementary School to William Peca. Kenmore Elementary School currently operates as a K-5 school. William Peca operates as a K-6 school. This proposal would send the sixth grade of William Peca to Kenmore Middle School. The second proposal regarding the sixth grade involves reassigning the remainder remainder of Woodmore Elementary School to Benjamin Tasker and Ernest Everett Just. Currently, they have a split boundary where the middle school assignments are split between the two schools, and Benjamin Tasker receives the students at the sixth grade level, whereas Jer Everett Ernest Just does not. And there are approximately 23 students that are in the sixth grade at Woodmore. This proposal would again eliminate the sixth grade and send those students to Ernest Just as uh, sixth grade students. Uh, before you, you see a schedule that was uh, proposed for general public information as part of the Educational Facilities Master Plan. You're not being asked to endorse this schedule, but it was included merely as information item for the public in terms of uh, giving them advance indication of possible future changes in regards to the sixth grade. I mentioned that there were a number of minor boundary changes. Those are changes affecting two or less than uh, 20 students, uh, primarily in regards to fixing prior problems with the boundaries, uh, usually misalignment of the boundaries and illogical assignments. Again, in all of these changes being proposed, two or fewer students are impacted by those, and those students would be given the option of remaining as transfer students so that they would not have to change schools. Again, these changes if approved would be implemented for this coming school year, and there are two administrative changes that are also being 
proposed for that uh, implementation at that time. One, again, is the adjustment of the early childhood um, education boundaries to incorporate Kenmore as a operating early childhood center. The second one is an adjustment of the ESAW boundaries. Currently, children that reside in the Potomac High School attendance area are being sent to Oxen Hill Element, uh, Middle High School uh, for ESAR services. Given the number of students that are being transported, currently numbering about 84, uh, the ESAR department believes that they can be more effectively and cost efficiently educated at Potomac High and that the busing would not be necessary. And so we're proposing that the um, boundaries be realigned to leave those children in their boundary school rather than sent to a different school for ESAW services. A uh, map showing the proposed, uh, the potential realignment of the early childhood center boundaries and also again uh, information that was provided to the public in terms of soliciting uh, comments for them. With that, um, I would then welcome any questions that you have regarding the uh, proposal. Thank you very much, colleagues. We will stand for questions at this time. I have Ms. Boston. I assume Ms. Jacobs, you are on the list. Ms. Boston. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. One of them, what, is, what will be the cost of transferring students that live in the, uh, the neighboring um, of Kenmore Elementary School, our neighborhood kids, to, uh, I think they're going to William Paker, if I'm not mistaken, or are there other that, schools or just that one school? That Just that one school. Okay. Again, we don't have a precise cost estimate. Right now, I believe approximately 30% of the students, and again, I stand to be corrected, in terms of our walkers, in terms of reassigning them to William Paker, there would be bus services that are necessary that would be accommodated primarily by extending existing bus routes uh, to serve uh, William Paker. Again, we don't have a uh, definitive cost estimate in terms of the uh, incremental increase that might be experienced there. Right, because Kim Kenmore Ele is it's kind of like a neighborhood school, so kids are really attending that live in that area. Right. And right. Uh, if they were walkers, then the majority of those kids will have to be bus. Am I, am I mistaken? Uh, you are correct in as far as the, and I just want to refer to the actual numbers so I don't misstate the uh, fact. And I apologize. I thought we had the uh, transportation numbers on the slide. We do not. Uh, but I, I, it was my belief that approximately 30 to 40 percent of the students were walkers. The remainders are, were already on a bus. Okay. I mean, I, I, I understand. I, I think it's one, you've got to balance it because right. even with the overcrowding in our uh, other uh, early childhood centers, um, you know, that, that's a transportation cost as well, trying to, to get them. So, you know, I, I know it's hard for us to try to, to make, a, make a good um, balance as far as transportation costs because we, we're still incurring it either way. Um, but I'm still concerned that the neighborhood kids, uh, how many kids and, and is that going to increase the cost on transportation. The other th thing that, that's concerning me is the overcrowding at Kenmore Middle School. It was already overcrowded and then we're proposing to you really overcrowded by what, what is that, about 89%? Right now, the uh, school is operating at approximately 106% of its state rated capacity, 6% over its uh, uh, estimated capacity, and this proposal would increase that overage to 12%. Uh, again, there is room uh, in terms of using temporaries to mitigate the uh, impact of that. And again, as you note, that our, some of our middle schools are increasing, uh, increased enrollments, and we're seeing that effect in multiple uh, locations. Yeah, but we're, we're just about doubling the overcrowding. With the, with, I'm looking at, if I'm looking at your chart correctly yeah. here, 
Uh, that's correct. Uh, it is doubling in terms of percentage terms and the actual numbers on the order of about, um, I want to say 45 students. I, I want to interject a little bit just because I have the projected enrollment for Kidmore for next year at 759, which puts it at 98%. They have seven temps there currently, which brings the capacity down to 80%. So we, we have, have seven temps? Yes, we do. Whoa. So, so, mm, so how is that going to increase the class size? What is going to be, you know, because I, I'm always concerned about our middle schools because that's where we're having the most problems uh, as far as, you know, academically uh, getting our kids where they need to be in that middle school. And, and to, to, put so, to put that much overcrowding in that one middle school it really concerns me. I, I haven't seen, I don't, you might have presented this before, but the numbers looking at it now looks a little bleak to me. Of course, we'll move um, staff with students as we do with um, all of our enrollment. So as we increase the number of students, we will also increase the staff. One of the things I should mention is that we have had conversations with the principal of Kenmore Middle School regarding the impact of the additional school assignments to their school, and she was in welcoming, if you will, of the reassignment, and again, is looking forward to having additional sixth well, graders Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's student-based budget, and I can I understand that, that. but, okay. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. When you, when you get a chance, I'd like to see those numbers for transportation, please. Ms. Jacobs. Thank you. Um, for the Kenmore parents, what, what was the date of the letter that they received and what did it say? The letter was mailed on the 27th of December, and again, there were several letters depending upon exactly what the address was. Part of what we tried to do is to anticipate and to advise the parents regarding the proposal that was being forwarded and what the specific impact would be on them. So um, I'll read a sample of, those, of one of those letters to you. Okay. Uh, the letter reads, in October 2014, Prince George's County Public Schools had a series of public forums to discuss potential changes to boundaries, grade configurations, and programs. Public input on these potential changes was received through the public forums, an online comment form, emails, telephone calls from parents, students, public officials, and community members. Based on the input, the Chief Executive o Officer, Kevin Maxwell, PhD, has recommended several changes which, in, um, printed in bold, if approved, may impact your school's, uh, your child's school. A PowerPoint presentation which details the CEO's recommendation is available and it gives the website. There's a second paragraph which speaks to the individual family circumstance and as far as where they would be re uh, reassigned. And then the letter concludes with two paragraphs, one saying, on January 31st, 2015, a public hearing will be held at Sasser Administration Building located at uh, 14201 School Lane in Upper Marlboro at 7 p.m. to discuss these changes. If you wish to testify, during the hearing, please call 301-952-6115 to register before 4 p.m. the day of the hearing. Participants may speak for three minutes. Written comments may be, may be submitted to board comments at pgcps.org prior to the hearing date. On February 10th, the Board of Education will hold a vo vote to recommend uh, on the recommended changes. The final uh, paragraph reads, if you have any questions, please call 301-952-6300 or email psb.boundaries at pgcps. Thank you for your support of Prince George's County Public Schools. 
Thank you. You know what that? Uh, Ms. Eubanks. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Boston. You asked some of the same questions I wanted to ask, and I would like the costs for that transportation as well. Um, I have a question when it comes to one of your slides said minor adjustments for early childhood. I don't remember which number um, that was. I'm sorry, I lost. I lost my place. I couldn't find it on here. Um, do you know where I'm speaking of? That's what, that's what I'm speaking of. Could you um, explain what that means by minor adjustments? Childhood Center? Yes. Or, okay. Right now, every address in Prince George's County is assigned to one of the three operating early childhood center, Francis Fuchs, um, Chapel Forge, or to H. Depp Winship Wheatley. Okay. By introducing a fourth early childhood center, which we're proposing to do as Kenmore Elementary, we would realign the boundaries to reassign some addresses to that location, and that would become the destination of choice for participants in the early childhood program. Okay. We would not expect that uh, Chapel Forge's boundaries would be changed at all. We would anticipate reducing the boundary for both uh, Francis Fuchs and H. Winship Wheatley in terms of reducing their size and having the reduced area reassigned to Kenmore Elementary, thereby reducing transportation costs for the, uh, and the uh, travel time for those students. So what would that speak to for families who have their kids? Would they be mandated to now move their child from one ch early childhood place to another? There are some families, a limited number of families, that may have that impact. Because of the age that the center serve, most of the participants are four years of age. At five years of age, they are assigned to their neighborhood elementary school. And so there is naturally a substantial turnover in the, in the population of these centers on every year. It is only those students that are currently three-year-olds and lie in the, redu in the changed area that potentially would be impacted. Is there some way if that parent decided that they did not want to move their three-year-old? Because you're talking about a three-year-old who is already trying to form friendships and everything else and trying to learn, and you're going to pick them up and move them somewhere else. Is it a possibility where they can apply and stay where they are? Uh, one of the things that the special education department does in terms of um, making assignments for not only early childhood center but any special education program is that they account for uh, again the before and after services that a child uses and they take that into consideration in the school assignment so the assignment is not purely based on residence and thereby if again it would you know, substantially impact a parent, they would have the opportunity as part of their IEP review to discuss and request remaining at the uh, original uh, early childhood center. Okay. Um, I know financially, as adults, we all have to sometimes make decisions and do things we don't want to do or we choose not to do, but that's why it's very, very important for me to see the cost of the bus. Um, that's, that's really important to me. Um, uh, I had something else, I think. That's it for now. Okay. Um, Ms. Boston covered most of it. Thank you. I'll come back if I have something later. Thank you, Ms. Banks. Ms. Williams. And just so we know in the queue, I have uh, Williams, Valentine, Kaufman, and myself. Um, and I, I have, I've started a round two list, so if folks want to go around two, let me know. 
Thank you for the presentation. Um, when I saw Thomas Claggett on the list, I was saddened because I went there as an elementary school student. So it's always sad to see a school on a chopping block. Um, my question is, has there been any kind of study or cost projections for changing these schools or repurposing these schools for um, the new purpose? And what, what are those costs? When the idea uh, was first introduced as a possibility, again, at that point, it was not a firm recommendation on the part of the CEO. Uh, we put a placeholder in the uh, budget, in the CIP budget. I believe the placeholder um, represented approximately $700,000 for possible conversion. Again, part of what that rather coarse cost estimate was based on was prior experience in repurposing again, other elementary schools into early childhood center educations. Since the original idea had been uh, raised, the staff of the early childhood center had an opportunity to walk the um, actual school at Kenmore Elementary in terms of identifying how suitable and ready uh, it might be in regards to use as an early childhood center. Again, the um, actual layout, if I'm not mistaken, mirrors that of Chapel Forge, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, and um, actually, I think, uh, Ms. Golson, did you want to speak to the? Approximately $718 for the ECC, which was submitted in our IAC request for FY16. Okay. Now, with these schools, um, early childhood centers, would they be open FY16 or? Okay. Yes, they would. Um, let's see if I had anything else that wasn't already asked. No? That's it. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Mr. Val Ms. Valentine, no. Okay, Mr. Kaufman. I will see when he comes back, so I'll, I'll uh, uh, let me jump in for a couple of quick questions. One, just kind of a real quick summary, if you can, for me um, about our kind of uh, new move to, to kind of go away from K, K through 6 and go more K5 through K8. How many schools are, are kind of currently in that situation and, and what our plan is? And, and just a quick word about why I remember we had this conversation, and, and, and some, of the, some of that answer had to do with practical concerns around transportation and costs, and then I asked a question about education benefit as well. I don't remember that. But. I don't have the total number of schools in front of me. I know on slide 16, we, these are the remaining schools, and um, we've provided a projection of when we'd like to look at the remaining schools moving their sixth grade to middle schools. So, so to make clear, so we say possible, and this on that this on, on slide, I'm on 16 now. Mm -hmm. Possible proposal by FY 1617. Those are all K six schools that are that that are being projected to go to K five. That's correct. That's that correct. we have not presented to the board yet. Right. But we've right. This we've is just created a, possible a plan that, that for well, multiple years, right. so no okay. one will be blindsided. Right. And so this represents, in, in the list of, uh, for possible for SY 1819, Correct. essentially that would represent, if we did everything like this, all of our elementary schools Correct. would be K-5. Correct. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. I, I got that. Um, I want to also go back for uh, another piece of clarity around Kimmel Middle School and the overcrowding issue. Um, I wasn't clear with what you said, but it, uh, it sounded like there are current plans, when we look at this slide and it says we're gonna be 112% over enrolled, that the projections might be different and, and it could be that, that it could be better than that. Is that how I understood it? Could you explain okay. that again for me? So the presentation that was presented here was provide, the data that you see is before the projected enrollment numbers, which were issued on February 3rd, February 3rd. And those numbers show that for Kenmore, projected enrollment is will be at 759. The so, that, S, the so just make it 759. Correct. And that projected enrollment is inclusive of this change. No, because you have It does. It, 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 it includes is inclusive it. of the change. Okay, 759 includes. is inclusive of this change. Perfect. Okay. Yes. 
the state rated capacity of Kenmore Middle School is 773. So that brings the utilization of the building to 98%. The site, you, you ready for me to keep going? No, no, because no. I'm so long. So okay. the state rated capacity is 773? Correct. Okay, but in the slide it says we have 740 and we're over capacity. Where are we? My Kim math ain't Moore, great, but it's not that quite that bad. Kimmore <laughs> Elementary. I don't see state rated capacity on your So so I would so if I read I that I would assume that state rated capacity was six ninety five if I read that correctly. Yeah. And and yeah, that is right? that is correct. Um, there, one of the things that you may be aware of is that there's a master plan support project which is currently re-examining our, our schools throughout the school system, including reassessing state rated capacity. Again, the uh, information, um, those have not been officially revised at this point. I don't have the, uh, any changes to the state rated capacity of Kenmore. And what I have is the official state rated capacity, not the revised based on the utilization study. It is the official. So that information there is incorrect. So that's right. Wrong. Correct. Right. That's so incorrect. that size wrong. So, correct. So and the, and so right now today there are For nine temps. There are seven temps. There are seven temps. Correct. And with those seven temps. Mm -hmm. That brings us to an eighty percent capacity. Oh, include so including the seven temps, which which we correct, and we are uh, I, I assume anticipating that those temps would still be in use. Yes, next they year. could be, right. but I also just sent to the associate suits a recommendation to remove two of them, which would still bring their capacity to eighty three percent. Right. Oh, so so next year it could be five. Correct. Temps, so we have two less temps. Okay. All right, uh, I think that's all the questions I have. Ms. Mundy. Thank you. Dr. Kaufman, you're, you're next. You lost your place, man, when you were <laughs> Thank you. I just had a question about the, um, the revision in middle school, the grades from um, six through eight, excuse me, seven and eight, and a move to go from to six, seven, and eight. And I guess I just want to kind of understand the rationale to moving to that model. Um, we have several middle school models. We have the academy model. We have the, like I said, six, seven, and eight model. Then we have some that is seven and eight. And we do have the schedule here of planning to have them. Is it just to be more consistent? Is there research that suggests that this six, seven, and eight model produces better outcomes? I guess I'm just trying to understand why this push and this plan to, to change the model or to have these schools, um, sixth grade, leave these schools. Um, several schools in District 7 are affected. Barack Obama was one of them that was quite controversial at the time, but there are others that I see as possible proposals moving forward. So I just kind of want to understand the rationale behind that. Mm -hmm. Our research and evaluation department conducted a study several years ago that showed that our students perform better when they're in the six, seven, eight um, configuration versus um, being in the middle school for just two years. So what was it in that research that was the linchpin that they performed better? Was it being among older students? Was it? I, I can't remember all the components, but I'll be glad to request it and provide it to you. Thank you. Dr. Kaufman. Um, I just had a question about the utilization study. Is that, and that, is that the same thing as the master plan? Okay. So can you just say a little bit about how that's going to work? And because there is a mention here uh, when it comes to Kenmore Elementary School that it would likely be um, still underutilized after that plan. So how do you, um, you know, how do you know that? And what is sort of what are the without going into great detail? Because I know we were, we it could perhaps be a separate conversation, but just give us a quick overview and then sort of when does that happen? How what are the components and how what are the steps that are taken after that? Again, the utilization study was actually uh, engendered by uh, state legislation and had a uh, target date in December. As a result of that target date, again, consultants were brought on board, and part of their challenge was in terms of assessing the existing use and utilization of our facilities. So they did not 
include in their analysis any proposed changes. So they looked at Kenmore as it presently exists today, along with its population of, as of today. Um, again, they also collected fundamental information which would allow us to reassess the capacity in different uses or with a different student population. That reassessment would not occur until, again, later this spring. So what information are they collecting that we wouldn't already be collecting and that would be feed it, fed into these analyses that we're talking about, you know, related to these changes? One of them is, a, is really much more detailed than we presently have. Part of what we have is a normal cycle in terms of reassessing how a facility is actually being used in terms of whether or not a classroom has been repurposed into a uh, office, for example. They would have identified that that, in fact, is a classroom, and in terms of computing the capacity, should be included in the fundamental uh, capacity of that building. They would also, in their analysis, again, identify where certain uses that you would expect and desire to be in your core building had been relocated to attempts because of overcrowding. And again, recomputing the uh, capacity would uh, <coughs> place that use inside of the building rather than in temp. And again, identified as being overcrowded, specifically in those instances. So basically, it's, it's a more fine-grained, detailed analysis. But you're confident that even, even though that analysis has not been completely conducted, am I correct, in the case of Kenmore, that given what you know about the school and what they're likely to find, that, that it's not going to significantly change the analysis of the uh, the current utilization. That, that is correct. Okay, thank you. All right, we have a couple of round two. Ms. Jacobs. Um, I guess we might should go to whoever else had to speak, but you know, I was thinking when I read this a few weeks ago and then today again um, with it being on the board agenda that um, it's my opinion that the board really doesn't even have authority to vote on this issue under the um, legislation relative to the CEO and that particular law under the superintendent's authority it gives the superintendent full authority to make decisions about boundaries and it specifically says that if, if a motion would be to reverse the superintendent's decision as opposed to voting for it um, <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons I asked the question about what the letter said because I think the letter I heard him say if approved, but I didn't hear him say it said if approved by the board. And I don't know if that was intentional or not. But that being the case, um, that's my assumption. Um, that being the case, I don't think that the board has authority under under the new provisions of the law to to approve this particular thing. If and if there's a difference of opinion, I would ask to separate the question of clo school closures um, and the um, movement to the sixth grade fifth grade to sixth grade, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that being, the, and, and I would also suggest that we may not even have authority on that one. So yeah, we, we were having a discussion about this for clarity uh, uh, a while ago, just to be clear. So Ms. Battle, what? what if you all wanted to take an action to prohibit it, it would take two thirds of a vote to stop it. Right, that's my point, is that it's, there is, a, a motion to approve would be, in my opinion, you know, okay for the superintendent if that's what the board wanted to do, but I don't think it's needed. Right. So what I would recommend in this case, because we do this on a pretty regular basis for a whole bunch of other things that fall under this purview, is we take a vote to support. If that vote to support were to fail, then the next step to be would then to see if there was a motion to oppose, and there would be a two-thirds majority required. but. I think that your point, well, it, it, it could be considered technically valid. There are probably dozens of things that we've already voted on that fall under this, this purview that if we were to fail, if the vote were not to pass, we'd have to then flip it and go. So I would, I would propose that we move forward to a vote, and if the vote to support doesn't pass, then we go back and, uh, and see if we have two-thirds uh, in order to make the next step. Ms. Battle, is that this is basically the way we've been conducting business already? Exactly. Okay. I disagree, but go ahead. That, that was okay. okay. I stated my disagreement. Ms. Williams? 
I want to thank you for opening the door to talk about Akaki Academy since another one of the participants in the meeting um, brought it up. And you may not know the answer today, but the information that I'm looking for is at the end of the um, renovation and the additions and all that down at Akaki Academy to um, know what the state rated capacity is versus the um, actual capacity at the school. And is there some consideration of um, either boundary changes or support in the administration of managing so many students? I think currently they're at 1,400 students in that school with a principal, and I'm not sure how many assistant principals, but it's a very large campus. And um, so if you don't have the numbers now, I would definitely <coughs> like to get some follow-up on those numbers. And uh, it will have to be a follow-up. I do not have the, that information now. All right, colleagues, I see uh, no, other, um, no other speakers. So that will conclude the presentation part of this. Thank you very much. Uh, for your time and for taking that time to go. What I want to do is, again, before we double back, go back straight to uh, second reader's unfinished business. I yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell for an introduction of items 8.1 through 8.3 on the governance second readers. Where's Dr. Maxwell? Um, Right. Items 8.1 to 8.3 are on the agenda for approval of the changes to the school boundaries and grade structures, board policy 9354, and the Prince George's County Public Schools new vision, mission, and core values. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, I'll entertain a motion. I know at least one of them, the board, that we want to take separately. Um, uh, so uh, without uh, objection from the board, in fact, uh, it may be easier just to take each one of these separately because we might have a change on, on one of them. No problem. That okay? Okay. So we'll start uh, with, uh, I'll entertain a motion for item 8.1 on the governance uh, secondary chief executive's recommendation for school boundary and structure changes. We can't vote without a motion. So moved. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion seeing none uh, mrs. Berkeley would you please call the roll dr. Anderson mr. Burroughs miss Epps miss Eubanks miss Hernandez Yes. Ms. Jacobs? No. Dr. Kaufman? Yes. Ms. Mundy? Ms. Quinteros Grady? I will abstain. I need that. Do I have to do yes, no? No? Okay. I just want more information. I just feel like I. One more information. What's your final decision, ma'am? No. No. Mr. Valentine. Aye. Aye. Ms. Williams? Yes. Ms. Boston? Yes. Dr. Eubanks? Yes. Seven yes. Two no. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, we'll go on to item 8.2, um, uh, budget uh, board policy 9354. Uh, and um, when uh, this was remanded back to the policy committee to put specific language changes, that's been done. Uh, and I believe the committee wants to offer uh, an additional uh, change from what you uh, have proposed. So uh, uh, Ms. Jacobs? Okay, thank you. Um, in addition to um, the, the um, board direction from the last meeting, we want to add <clears throat> the following language, which everybody should have it. 
Anyway, Section 3103B of the Education Article Annotated Code of Maryland provides that a member of the Board of Education may not be reimbursed more than $7,000 in travel and other expenses incurred in a single fiscal year. Any unspent funds from this capped fund at the end of each fiscal year shall revert back to the operating budget to be allocated by the board for the benefit of the students of Prince George's County Public Schools. Contributions to any one or group of schools made by the board is appropriate as long as the contribution provides a benefit for students and or schools and uses operating funds derived solely from unspent expense funds of the previous fiscal year. A board member may bring recommendations to the board for approval. The board may not provide a contribution to support religious activities in schools. And that's a motion. Is, may I have a second? Second. So, and just for, by way of further explanation, because that, that would replace language, and could you talk a little bit about the, the committee's intent there? So, this was designed to replace uh, language that's in the board policy. Um, board members often want to contribute to schools mm -hmm. across the district. and. Um, to try to avoid an administrative nightmare for um, the CEO and his office, we thought it was better to create a process by which board members who have funds in their individual accounts by law um, who want to contribute um, those funds at the end of a school year. So the first year, um, it, it, it's sort of not productive because, you know, at the end of a school year is June, kids aren't in school. So what would happen is funds that are left over from this year would go to next year, and that would give board members an opportunity to present to the board um, different activities or events or things that they feel are, are good for schools and make recommendations for funds to go there. And it gives us an opportunity, obviously under the law, to, to, um, to go to incurred expenses, but the will of the board to give also to our constituents. Students. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, on the amendment, uh, are there any questions or comments, debate? Any questions, comments, debate? Hearing none, I'll just do a voice vote on the amendment. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed. That motion carries. Now we'll go on to the board members vouchered expenses and I will entertain a motion to approve as amended. It's been moved and seconded to approve uh, board policy 9354 as amended. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Berkeley, please call the roll. Motion to accept item 8.2 with amendments. Dr. Anderson, Mr. Burroughs, Ms. Epps, Ms. Eubanks, Ms. Hernandez, aye. Ms. Jacobs, Dr. Kaufman, aye. Ms. Mundy, Ms. Quintero Scrady, aye. Mr. Valentine? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Ms. Boston? Aye. Dr. Eubanks? Aye. Nine ayes. That motion carries. Thank you very much. Item 8.3, I'll entertain a motion to approve Prince George's County Public Schools' new vision, mission, and core values. So moved. It has been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Let me just say, of all the things that we talked about today, this is perhaps the most powerful imp and impactful, and I, I thank folks for the time and effort that they put on this. Uh, and seeing no other discussion, uh, Ms. Berkeley, please call the roll. Dr. Anderson, Mr. Burroughs, Ms. Epps, Ms. Eubanks? Aye. Ms. Hernandez? Aye. Ms. Jacobs? Yes. Dr. Kaufman? Ms. Mundy? Ms. Quintero Scrady? 
Aye. Mr. Valentine? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Ms. Boston? Yes. Dr. Eubanks? Yes. Nine ayes. Thank you. That motion carries. I'm going to try to uh, plow through as quickly as I can. I know at least two board members are going to be leaving. That will leave us with seven, so we'll have enough to conduct business, but not by much. So I'm going to whip through these first readers and at least get to uh, entertaining uh, uh, executive session. Is that OK? So I'm going to yield the floor to you, Dr. Maxwell, for an introduction of uh, item 9.0 uh, on the first reader. Thank you, uh, Dr. Eubanks. Uh, item 9.1 is on the agenda as a first reader, requiring no discussion. May I have a motion to accept item 9.1 under new business first reader? So moved. May I have a, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of accepting this item as first reader, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you, that motion carries. Um, we're finished with that. Uh, follow up items. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go, oh, you want to do oh, follow-up items? Uh, Ms. Jacobs. I, wanted, I just wanted to make sure Ms. Berkeley was, um, caught my comment and request for the um, breakdown of county-funded projects compared to state-funded projects to include, correct, to include, include the planning breakdown of planning and final, the difference between planning money and the final um, approval of the project by the state. Um, so uh, that concludes our business other than we're going back to item 4.1, colleagues, uh, and, and, and Dr. Maxwell, we're, le we're missing two folks. There are seven, so we still have quorum, and we can continue with item 4.1, but I would leave that to. Did you need to confirm, did you say, did you do executive session? I haven't done that yet, but I'm gonna wait, you know, because we still have quorum, I can do that. Okay. All right. But I, I'm gonna wait and see <laughs> if we'll still have quorum at the end if we go through item 4.1. So 4.1, 4, 4 I'm going to turn over to Ms. Colson for an introduction. Okay. Right. And, and I so, want to make sure for my, oh. we, we will not, I, I need all seven of us to stay through item 4.1 so that we can, I never count myself. I, I told you earlier I wasn't good at math. So we have, there's eight. All right, so, I, so only, no more than one person can leave. Who wants to leave? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. All right. So we'll continue. Let's get this done. And, and unless you want to move it to the next meeting, we'll get it done. No, I, I think we've asked our employees to first delay from the day to the night. And now I'm, they're sitting here almost till tomorrow morning. I just as soon let I'm them with. off the hook. Not right. None of them. They, Ms. You know, they want they wanted to stay this late. I could tell. I, I, at, I can tell they're enjoying tell. themselves, Dr. Eubanks. I can Eubanks. tell how excited they are. Good evening. The Division of Supporting Services is comprised of five departments and oversees approximately 3,600 school system employees. The work of this division supports the five pillars of the coherence framework and works to ensure that we provide a safe, healthy, and welcoming environment for students, staff, and community while we efficiently and safely transport students and provide nutritious meals daily. Tonight, you will hear from the directors of each of these departments. A summary of their initiatives for the 2014-2015 school year will be shared as well as just three of their performance measures that captures only some of the areas that we focus on in this division. Please note that even though only a few measures are shared here today, the work of the division requires that we monitor a variety of metrics that move our district forward to meet the challenges of the 21st century and to ensure that we are great by choice. Without further delay, I present to you the Director and, and Safety Officer for the Division of Supporting Services. Thank you. 
sorry about that. Thought I turned it on. <laughs> to provide safety programs and uh, safe uh, environments for our students here in Prince George's County. This includes non-school sites, school sites, bus stops, and walking routes. Our key initiatives include routine fire and safety inspections in schools, buildings, and grounds. With these uh, inspections, we evaluate current fire and safety conditions in these schools, buildings, and grounds. During these inspections, we ensure that the documents comply with a HERA law, our policy on the white fire book, and our emergency plans. We also oversee the inspection and repair of playgrounds in conjunction with building services. We coordinate CPR and AED training classes. I am proud to say that we have uh, added AEDs to middle schools and offices in the last few years, and in the future we hope to get them in the elementaries as well. We assist with compliance of fire alarms, sprinklers, hydrants, schools, and office sites. New to the school district this year is the maintenance of a online uh, material safety data sheet which enables any employee 24-7 to go online and pull up a material da a da safety data sheet for any material that may affect their work condition. We coordinate the annual medical monitoring program for maintenance and plan operations. This is a medical program that ensures the health and safety of our uh, workers that may uh, be exposed to asbestos. And finally, we gain uh, and work with risk management to uh, coordinate the uh, accident data injury to identify safety issues and make our schools safe. Our measurable goals, just three of many, uh, is to perform safety inspections at all our school buildings. We try to get to 70 schools per year. So far we have gotten to 45. Our number of safety investigations, we anticipate, because these are requested investigations, we anticipate 50 per year. Right now, we're up to 31 uh, cases resolved and closed. And finally, percentage of schools reporting monthly uh, fire drills is at 68. Actually, it changed today to 72. And this is, I have to emphasize, this is only reporting. We, we, we will be working with schools to try to get a, a higher compliance of reporting. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Rex Barrett, the Director of Security Services. Thank you, Mr. Curl. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Ms. Golson stated earlier, we do have a, a few of our uh, measurable goals, outcomes, and key initiatives listed. I'm going to touch on a few of them, um, obviously with the hour being what it is. Um, I would like to start, obviously, with the mission. Obviously, our mission is to provide a safe and orderly learning environment that enhances the safety and security of students, staff, visitors, and parents. Obviously, it's a, an important part of our coherent framework. Uh, when you look at uh, high student achievement, Safety and security is, is vital to uh, maintain that. Our key initiatives, uh, some of them here, uh, we've installed electronic entry systems, panic buttons, and closed circuit TV uh, camera systems at uh, all of our schools that did not have them. Um, obviously, that was a, a major uh, undertaking. It took us about 14 months to do it, but they're all uh, installed and fully operational. In addition, we also uh, installed visitor management systems to uh, all of our schools and facilities. Um, as of 120, uh, 2015, we had scanned over 120,000 visitors, and we had 52 hits for registered sex offenders. Um, when we have a hit, um, we get notified as well. We reach out to the school. We provided a uh, guide to them as to what uh, measures to take if they do have somebody that's registered on that list. Um, obviously, uh, they're politely asked uh, not to uh, be in a facility uh, unescorted uh, as one of many uh, initiatives with that. Our measurable outcomes and goals, obviously the key one is to reduce criminal incidents that occur within our school system, uh, whether it be at a school-based facility or school property in general. Um, some of those incidents, just to give you an idea, some would be assault, some could be vandalism, some could be thefts. Um, it's a major undertaking. Um, as you can see on the slide, that we've reduced our incidents by 30%. Um, I was asked a few times as to uh, what attributes to that. And when you look at the comprehensive plan that we've done uh, systemically, uh, when you look at uh, lead investigators, supervisors at the schools, when you look at uniforms, uh, when you look at the uh, physical security uh, installations that took place, and then when you look at the teamwork at the schools themselves, the principals, administrators, PPWs, 
uh, community groups, when you look at community diversion programs, all of that is attributed to a decrease in what you see up here. Um, another was arrests. Two years ago, to give you an idea, uh, when we looked at our school-based arrests, we were over 1,000. Obviously, that was a very high number. Uh, so one of our key goals was to bring that down. Last year, we brought it down 26%, and this year, we're down another 30%. So we're going to hit about 450 or so this year. So when you look at what it was two years ago, it's a significant decrease. We've increased our camera systems uh, to 5,500 active cameras. We still have a few admin buildings that we're doing, uh, so that number will go to about 5,650 by the time we're done. Every year we conduct four systemic lockdown drills to make sure that our staff and our students are prepared in the event of an emergency. To date, we've already conducted three of those. Uh, matter of fact, one was uh, yesterday. We have one more to go. Um, with that, I would like to introduce the Director of Building Services, Mr. Carl Belcher. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Good evening, everyone. Our mission in uh, building services is to provide a clean, healthy, and safe working environment for students, staff, and the community. Rather than go through all the things necessary to accomplish uh, this mission, I just want to focus on uh, two. One is uh, the uh, second item, that is to provide uninterrupted use of all facilities supportive of highly effective uh, teaching. This involves uh, being proactive rather than being reactive. And I'm going to explain more about this uh, when I discuss uh, some key initiatives. The, the second item I want to focus on is effectively and efficiently protect the asset value of all facilities and equipment while conserving energy, water, and resources. Our focus here is being uh, energy efficient and protecting our environment. We're involving our recycling office. We're uh, bringing in uh, energy uh, professionals from the uh, outside, uh, as well as uh, involving our, our maintenance uh, personnel. We have several uh, key initiatives, and uh, I'm just going to focus uh, on a few of them. Uh, the first is uh, continuing implementation of Health First uh, Cleaning System. Health First Cleaning System is a team effort uh, to ensure that basically no spot is missed as far as, uh, as cleaning. We employ a uh, comprehensive uh, uh, task list of items to be accomplished and a rigorous schedule to, uh, to get those things done. It also involves uh, the use of uh, green cleaning pr uh, products as an uh, alternative uh, to our uh, basic cleaning products. We also are implementing facility usage and prevent preventive plan maintenance uh, modules in, our, in, in school do. With uh, facility uses, usage, our community will be able to uh, seek app, uh, approval and from online. Basically, uh, this will allow us to free up some uh, resources uh, in our central offices. It will also allow us to schedule custodians. It will also in the future give us the ability to tie into our building uh, automation system. We are starting pilots in three schools for uh, facility usage, and I will uh, touch on that later as well. Uh, the plan preventive maintenance module is a proactive uh, approach where we grease, oil, uh, tighten, uh, do preventive maintenance things uh, to keep everything running instead of responding to uh, mechanical failures. This is going to uh, reduce overtime, and we're it's definitely going to extend the useful life uh, of the, the equipment. We're very uh, excited about the second uh, bullet point on this uh, slide, and that is the implementation of our employee handbook. With this handbook, we will provide in one central place all the rules and regulations uh, for our employees, and we'll also uh, provide uh, resources available to them. 
Currently, our employee handbook, the draft of it, is being reviewed by our employee and, re, uh, employee and labor relations uh, office. Beginning in next month, uh, we're going to roll out an online building services uh, customer satisfaction survey. This is going to be a short five to six uh, question survey following this strongly agree, strongly disagree format. It's going to be sent out weekly by key staff to uh, those people they have come in contact during the week. It's going to be simple to the point. We expect a great, res a great response and uh, completion rate. In terms of uh, measurable outcomes, by June uh, 5th, uh, 2015, 40 schools will uh, be fully implemented in the Health First Cleaning System. Uh, we are proud to say that currently we have 27 uh, schools. We've uh, implemented three schools since uh, this slide was prepared. We expect that by June uh, 2015, 100% of building supervisors will be trained in the green floor finish management system. Due to training that we conducted last week, we're currently at 85% uh, as opposed to the 12% when this slide was presented. We are also tracking the percentage of open work orders that remain open beyond 25 days will be reduced uh, to 50%. Currently, we're in the 80% uh, range. There is some data cleanup necessary that uh, will reduce this uh, figure uh, significantly. We expect this data cleanup to be uh, completed by next week. Uh, this data cleanup includes uh, completed work orders but not closed, those uh, work orders that are duplicates, those work orders that are void that are not work order scope. We're also uh, working with procurement to speed up the uh, uh, purchasing uh, process. Next, I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Lori Carter Evans, our Director of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Belcher. Good evening, everyone. Our mission, I'm sorry, our mission in a nutshell is to deliver efficient, safe, and timely service for our students. In order to achieve our mission, we have some key initiatives and performance measures we are implementing. A few of our key initiatives are displayed on the screen for your review, and I will highlight a couple of them. We are partnering with the Prince George's County Police Department to prevent motorists from passing our buses when they are loading and unloading our students. 20 of our buses have cameras mounted on the side of our buses. The cameras are on, on when the flashing stop sign is extended from the bus. Any vehicle that passes will cause the camera to take a snapshot of the license plate. Another initiative that we're proud of is that we have involved our internal Spanish-speaking stakeholders in providing training to our employees. It was impressive this summer to see our drivers and bus attendants enthusiastically repeating Spanish phrases during our back-to-school in-service. In order to continuously improve, we must measure our performance. Three of those measures are on-time performance, where we are at 90% of our buses that are arriving at least 10 minutes before the start of the school day, and we are looking to increase this to 93%. We also track our traffic violation citations. In FY14, we found that 193 citations were issued to our department, and so far in FY15, 82 citations have been received. We're looking to reduce this number by 15%. So we feel we're headed in the right direction in most cases and should, re should meet our reduction target. We're also tracking our preventable accidents. We track all of our accidents, but we're specifically looking at our preventable accidents. In FY14, we had 217. FY15, we have 84 to date, and our goal is a 15% reduction. 
And just for clarification, a preventable accident is one where a driver could have taken measures to prevent the accident from occurring by stopping, slowing down, or pulling to the side. So this concludes my portion of the presentation. Now I would like to present to you Ms. Joan Shorter, Director of Food and Nutrition Services. Thank you, Ms. Carter Evans. Good evening, everyone. Um, the mission for the Department of Food and Nutrition Services is simply to provide meal service to all of our students. Over the past couple years, we have expanded our service to include offering meals to community organizations um, with after school and supper programs. Some of our key initiatives are, are listed above, but I'd like to highlight two. Um, one is near and dear to our CEO, um, Dr. Maxwell, who is a strong supporter of um, school breakfast and very much supportive of the food service department increasing the breakfast participation in our schools. One way of doing that is to increase the number of elementary schools offering free breakfast in all of our classrooms, as well as looking at alternative delivery methods in our secondary schools so that we can get more high school and uh, middle school students to have breakfast. Another area that we're, we're focusing on this year as a key initiative is our implementation of our software module. Um, inventory software module that will assist us with our menu planning and our ordering practices in our schools. We will roll out the first phase in um, April of this year with 75 schools and we'll continue next year until all schools are up and running. Our measurable outcomes are many, but I'd just like to highlight these. In regards to meal participation, we look at those with the recent changes in the meal pattern requirements and all of the um, media um, hoopla around the changes, we were able to increase participation across the board in all meal types. Um, especially if we look at the breakfast, the farm's breakfast participation has increased tremendously. And that's part of um, our efforts to increase classroom breakfast feeding. Our meal benefit applications, we find that we have more families that are utilizing the online applications. We far ex exceeded our expectations from last year from 16,000, a little over 16,000 households to 44, over 44,000. The other area that we look closely at is our revenue. Um, and we look at our federal reimbursement because that is the bulk of our, our revenue. And so as we increase meal participations, our breakfasts, our lunches, our suppers, um, summer program, we also see an increase in our, in our federal re revenue that also assists us in terms of our funding source. So, we will continue as a food service department to increase participation, to work closely with schools so that we can have more students participate in the breakfast program. So at this time, I'd like to turn this over to Ms. Sarah Woodhead our department of, um, from the Department of Capital Programs. Thank you, good evening. And I'm, I'm the last in, in the line here. Um, so without further, do. The mission of the Department of Capital Programs is to deliver educationally appropriate and correctly sized facilities to the school system and community in order to provide sustainable, safe, and healthy environments conducive to teaching and learning. Our core services are in planning, design, project management, and fiscal management. And like my colleagues, I'll go through just a couple of um, initiatives on, on a couple of the slides here. Um, the master plan support project we talked about earlier, and just to highlight the major deliverables, there is the utilization study, and that's in just the final quality control and editing stages and should be released um, before the end of the month. And that does provide much more data than we've had before on the utilization of our schools. Um, the consultants are also conducting an educational adequacy assessment and that will provide um, a measure, a metric for uh, how well our school facilities support the programs and the uses that, that we're trying to carry out within them. Uh, we've taken the facility condition index, the FCI, and weighted it according to critical and priority systems to make it a more meaningful measure of the condition of our schools. And um, as a further stage, after the data is collected, the consultants will put together different scenarios for different funding levels 
so that we can see how well we can meet the needs of our school system in the future uh, with the current level of funding, with a higher level of funding, um, looking at different options, and that should help foster, I think, necessary discussion about where we want to head and how well we could move towards a modernization program. Um, also, just to highlight on the same slide, the educational specifications that were a first reader this evening um, are, are also one of our key initiatives, and those will serve as a foundation document for us going forward in terms of planning and design. Um, just a couple of other things to highlight. Uh, we have um, worked through most of our transition from a construction management model to project management. Our project managers are now assigned at, to projects at the beginning during the planning phase and they see them all the way through to completion and that we think will improve delivery and customer service. Um, we've also completed our acquisition of Primavera project management software. We're just beginning the implementation of the software that should help us with reporting and management and, um, and just program management overall. Um, also working with the purchasing department to upgrade our acquisition, our contract acquisition procedures. Um, for measures, we focused here tonight, uh, there are lots of different ways to look at it, but just at um, completion of projects and moving projects through the system. So for FY13, we had 118 projects overall, and of those, I have updated numbers from what were there when we put the slide together. Um, 88 projects are completed or in closeout, another 30 um, are still in construction and will be closed out by the end of the year. Some of those were um, based on seasonal work and we have to wait for the summer construction season. Um, for fiscal year 14, um, we now have um, 79 projects that are in construction versus the 22 on the slide. Another 39 are at the end of design or in um, purchasing to get contractors on board. For FY15, those are projects that were approved uh, last summer. Um, those are in planning and design, and several of them have moved into the bidding phase. Just a quick note on FY16, the state has issued the 75% um, recommendations for approval, and that for us totals 17.8 million. Um, it looks likely that we'll get a little bit less than we did last year from the state. We had a meeting with the county on the CIP, and they are working to get us a uh, number comparable to what we've had for the last few years. So the county at this point is looking like they'll be able to hold up um, a more typical level of spending. So that concludes the presentation and um, we're here for any questions you may have. Wonderful, thank you very much. Doesn't matter how late it gets, we always have questions. I have in the queue, uh, uh, Kaufman, myself, Ms. Jacobs, and Ms. Williams. Dr. Kaufman. Thank you, and um, thank you so much for all of you for sticking it out with us. And uh, there's a lot of great, oh, really, yes, thanks. There's a lot of great information in here, and um, uh, especially, I th I'm especially pleased to see all the measurable outcomes. I think that's really, really helpful data, and, and hopefully we can um, continue having that in any, all the presentations we receive from departments, because it really gets, gives us a sense of how we're how we're progressing. Um, and um, so hopefully that lifts your spirits a little bit that you had to stick it out. And I'll also lift your spirits by saying I had many questions, but I'm only gonna ask one follow-up question um, to, so we can get out of here relatively soon. Um, uh, to Mr. Curl about the fire drills, the monthly fire drills. I, you partly answered it already that this gap between how many schools has done it and how many the, the, that we want to accomplish um, is partly due to reporting, but it sounds like there's still some folks who are not necessarily doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so my question is just how can we make that, I mean, it seems like a relatively uh, easy problem to solve, which is just to say you guys need to be doing <laughs> fire drills every month. How can we get that, in, you know, that, that information out or, or order out to the principals? It's a very good question. Uh, yeah. The schools are doing the uh, fire drills. Okay, that's not the issue. The issue is in reporting. And some of it is that they're reporting to um, places other than the safety officer. We've initiated a program uh, starting next week, as a matter of fact, where we're actively going to call 
the schools and let them know if they haven't reported and say, would you please send it in? And I think we can solve it very quickly. Okay. That's great to hear that it's not a question of actually doing it. It's just a question right. of community. Yeah, they're, they're good and well schooled on doing the, uh, on okay. the fire drills. It's just the reporting is a, could be better. I agree with you. Thank you very and much. And actually, Dr. Kaufman, I, I, it's me over here. I, I, uh, I just actually, when I heard that, asked, uh, uh, I asked Ms. Golson to give me a list of the schools that haven't been reporting, and, and uh, I'll, I'll have a little involvement there myself. Thank you. I appreciate your help. That's great. <laughs> All right. So I'll go next. And since it's about bedtime, I'll tell a fable. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite ones. And uh, it's about uh, a priest goes up to three folks who are doing the same exact work. He asked the first one, what are you doing? He says, I'm making $20 an hour. He asked the second one, what are you doing? And he says, I'm laying bricks. And he asked the third one, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a cathedral. So I say all that to say, I'm so excited to see the ambitious missions that you've offered for us today, but I would propose this. Each and every one of you uh, don't have separate missions. You have one mission. I'm excited about the fact that we just passed it today, and it's on one of my I still have it on the sticky so you guys can have some time to memorize it. But your mission is to provide a great education that empowers all students and contributes to thriving communities. And I want your staff to really get excited about the fact that when you're driving buses and when you're dealing with food service and when you're dealing with safety, you're empowering our students and you're contributing to making sure that each and every one of them has a great education. So all this stuff that you say you're also doing, yes, that, that contributes to the mission. So I've been, these guys know I've been on my soapbox. Now, when we get this mission, it's one, it's one mission. So, um, uh, so thank you for all you do in, in that regard, and, and thank you for, for the tremendous work you do. I'm gonna add to Dr. Kaufman's comment about how much I appreciate um, the outcomes. Uh, and one of the things we always say is we wanna, we wanna hear when you come to us what your challenges are. So when I look at some of these goals, I'm saying these are great goals, but I'm, how are you gonna achieve these goals? What are your biggest challenges to them? Uh, and sometimes it's us, <laughs> right? Because there's some policy that's in the wrong place. Sometimes there's other systems. So there's a bunch of them. One of them that jumped out is, you know, our, our, we have a big backlog in our work orders. And I'm guessing that the challenges for reducing that is a little more than just tightening up the paperwork, <laughs> right? What is it gonna really take for us to meet these goals? Uh, uh, someone sent a note to me that said, yeah, I know you wanna know that, but it takes a lot more than 20 minutes to explain it. So, <laughs> so, so I get that, but I, we really wanna hear about the challenges so we could help to solve them and, and contribute to them. So let, so, me, let me start. Go, yeah, go ahead, absolutely. Um, one of those and challenges I, and, yeah. would be manpower. Um, and um, one of the things that um, when you all asked on Tuesday, my days are running together, for a request for um, what our budget would look like, it would have a component that would require a second shift for our maintenance program, which would allow us to have some additional staff in the evening who could go into our buildings and make those repairs when the students and staff are not present. We are limited to some of the things that we can repair during the day because we, also, we do not want to impact the delivery of instruction. And so that limits that time. So that's one of the things that we will be listing for you um, to provide as feedback um, that you have requested about areas if we were um, in an area where we could receive more funding than what we currently receive, that would be one area which would help to reduce the metric of the 25 or more days. So that's an example. And I'm, give, them, give, them, give me more, but not tonight. But I'd, I'd love to hear more of that and, uh, and, and those kind of examples. Thank you again for everything that you're doing. And uh, I'll go to Ms. Jacobs. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you for the presentation and for staying so late. Uh, I wanted to first um, address security. I know um, Rex, worked with the um, juvenile work group 
And I would just say oftentimes, sometimes, when people come from a law enforcement background, their perception is somewhat law enforcement driven all the time. And so I wanted to say I appreciate what you've brought to, um, to the school district because you were in that work group meeting saying we're not for arresting kids. And I think that, that makes a big difference when you're talking about our students and coming from um, someone with your background. Not that that's a bad thing, that's a good thing. Um, and pushing for uniformity among the security. So at one point in the school district, you just showed up if you were a security person in whatever clothes you were. And I think that's important to, to distinguish um, for students that, that ability. Um, I wanted to commend, it. well, when you talked about, um, Mr. Belcher, I think you talked about the, the clean initiative. Um, I appreciate that. Now, when I saw that, um, the spray bottle, it was green, so I was hoping that that also meant that it was green cleaning. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, so I, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm almost reluctant to make this statement after what Dr. Eubanks just finished saying, but I'll say it anyway. You know, I was thinking about the mission for transportation, and I was thinking about what we heard from our from one of our our um, bus drivers earlier, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe part of the mission should really be a, it's definitely we want to get kids there safely, but to include staff somehow, you know, I know you have your initiatives about training, but to let them know that we also care that they are safe in driving the students every single day. And sometimes, you know, words don't just do that. So I know, you know, I just thought I would point that out in terms of maybe having that be a bullet for what, so they can see mm -hmm. that they're also included in that process. Yes, and just to comment on that, we do recognize that our drivers experience assaults in, in the past. Um, and and that we do have less than ideal behaviors at, occasionally on our buses. So an initiative that we started this year was we're partnering with our security staff and they've actually, they are randomly checking some of our buses just to give us some support. Um, so, and we're also, of course, continuing to train our drivers on how to de-escalate some of the incidents that may occur. Mm -hmm. And so when that doesn't work completely, then we can also target that particular bus and have our uh, security personnel assist our drivers directly. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. And then the other, the final two things was, um, and I guess Ms. Golson might have to answer this question. So we've always had these issues around the bus lots and how safe employees are or not. And I know that was a lot of money associated with how do we bring those up to par. Can you speak to that, um, you know, the weather conditions? How are they doing? With the weather conditions at, at, at the, the bus, bus lot? And, and not in terms of driving, mm -hmm. but the safety of the drivers themselves and their, um, the environment that they are in parking and, and, and at, actually at the lot. At one time, they had no covers and things like and that. And the additional temps that were added. That's what yeah. she's right. Oh, okay. We have made some improvements to our bus lots. But, of course, you know, we were, will continue to do that. Um, Mulliken is a lot that we are going to use as our model so oh, that we can. Yeah, so that once <laughs> we have the bus lot in the, in the condition that we're looking at, looking mm -hmm. for, that will become our model. And as we move forward, then we'll continue to duplicate that at okay. our other bus lots. But there have been significant improvements, and we also have the support of Carl Belcher and his team mm -hmm. to address some of those more immediate needs at the bus, bus stops. Okay, thank you. And then finally, I would say um, on the, the healthy meals, um, so thank you. I know we were in a meeting, and you pointed out, which was a year or so ago, that I was eating celery. I probably should still be doing that. Um, but our students really should have healthy meals, and still we still sort of get you know, try to get to them, get them to, to also think they taste good. Um, but I would just say that I think since you've been here, you've really um, tried to make a difference in the types of meals and choices that students get. So you should be commended on that. So I just appreciate um, the work on those issues. And I, I think that was um, the last thing. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Ms. Williams, Mr. Ma Mr. Valentine, Ms. Grady, and Ms. Mundy. Mr. Ms. Williams. I'd just like to say that um, this is my very favorite division because I understand what you guys are doing and I love eating food, so. Um, you know, it's, it's just so unfortunate that one 
incident can ruin everything that you all are doing every day. I mean, we have, you know, so many students that we get to school every day on time, but if one bus is late, if one child is at the bus stop more than 15 minutes, the parent will make it seem like the entire system is broken, and it's not. If one student is uncomfortable in their classroom, you know, they will say, oh, the school is, is in a horrible condition, and it's not. I understand what it takes to, one, build a school and to maintain a school on, on a daily basis. It's a tough job, and so I appreciate what you all are doing and, and what you have accomplished. Um, the one question that I, I have a lot of questions, but the one question that I, that I think is, um, is, is still on the table is, is are, when are we going to hire a new chief for this department? Because, Ms. Golson, you, you taking on that position, it's, it's a lot. So I would like to know where are we on hiring a new chief for that position? So we, uh, you know, we had a, a process uh, for interviews and things, and it didn't yield a, a appropriate selection for us. So we have, um, uh, sort of been doing a more proactive like reaching out to people that we think would you know maybe be a, a good fit and we have uh, uh, I think our next meeting is I think the first week in March uh, which is what two weeks and if that yields a, a good possibility then we'll formalize a process but we're we're hoping that it's not gonna be too much longer I mean we're still you know again doing it we're just kind of being selective as opposed to just casting the net and spending a lot of time interviewing 20 people and not having the right person. Well, as soon as oh, we can. And I guess, yeah, the other piece I guess would be, yes, I think we told the board this so a while back, but um, Monica and I have also split up some of the responsibilities for the folks that you see here so that, okay. you know, there's, so, so uh, Monica still has a couple of them, but I have a couple as well. Okay. Um, and one last thing about the food service. We had breakfast the first day of school, and boy, was it a lot of food. I couldn't even eat it all. So, um, And it was very good. It was nothing like I remember when I was in, in school. We avoided school lunch as much as possible. Here I was like, mm, I'm going to come and have lunch with y'all breakfast every day. So I, I just want to say I really do appreciate all that you do. And, um, and I stay involved in this department because I understand it a little bit better. And plus, you all are great people, so I appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Valentine. Thank you. Um, I won't tell you a bedtime story. Um, uh, Rex, um, I wanted to uh, ask you a few questions about security and um, probably send you some other questions offline. Um, my understanding is the current sort of structure of how our security staff work in the school is that even though at our at a school level we have a principal who's a school leader, uh, but security staff do not report to that person. In my understanding, the principal does not evaluate security staff. Um, and as you might have heard earlier, there were some concerns about sort of the quantity of our staff in our schools. Uh, my concern more is about the quality and sort of what type of accountability measures we put in to make sure that they are. Um, at a post, uh, they are not sitting in the staff room, um, they are not congregating in one area, they are fully utilizing, um, you know, different uh, skills they've learned and how to canvas a building, uh, particularly at certain points of time, in, time in the day, um, and is really making themselves um, and leveraging some of the, uh, the knowledge they have of the building. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? I also talk about whether you all have reviewed that process of having them not report to the principal and to report to either a central person in the building and that person report to a regional person or the principal because it seems it's, I get mixed messages from principals saying that, you know, I don't control the security, I tell them to go to their post, they don't go, they won't listen to me, um, I try to report them and there's some frustrations around some school leaders. So if you can talk a little bit about that and some other questions I'll send to you offline. Absolutely. Um, it's actually quite a few questions, but I think I can get them. I know that we've been here kind of late, so I'm going to try and go quick with them. Um, when I first got here, what you expressed um, was very true. Um, I had a lot of, when you talk about challenges, 
um, where the direct reporting was not with the principal. It was with security services as a central office. Um, so what we've done is, and then also we had no supervisory personnel on site. So what we did was we uh, implemented a lead investigator position where that person is a supervisor on site and they report to the principal. So they're supposed to meet with the principal every day, meet with the SRO. They come up with a security plan that they agree to and that the staff is deployed that way. Now, if there are issues where it's not resolved at the schoolhouse level, I have middle managers and myself. I make myself very available to the principals and then I present to them normally about twice a year and we go over this. So if they have any issues or concerns that they can bring it to my attention and we'll deal with that directly. Especially if we have people that are refusing to, um, you know, follow out uh, whatever orders are given. Um, as far as accountability, one thing that we're in the final process of is uh, completing a brand new SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, because I believe in being transparent. I believe that all of our personnel and school-based personnel need to know what's expected of them from a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Um, it's gonna go to Shauna here soon uh, for general counsel so that they can review it for legal sufficiency before we actually issue it. Um, my hope is that by the time we start school year next year, that uh, everybody will be issued that document and they'll be held accountable to it. Um, another thing is training. Something else that you, uh, you hit on slightly. Um, I want their training to be more based on what they do day to day. Um, some of the in-service training that I've seen in the past wasn't really relevant to their day to day work. Um, so we're gonna make sure that it's tailored to that in addition to the SOP. Um, one other thing is communication skills. Um, I wanna make sure that they're given every opportunity to learn some of the uh, measures to uh, de-escalate a situation, take people from you know up here down to a level where they can be dealt with. Um, hopefully that answers it. It was a lot of information thrown out there uh, as one, um, but anything offline, just let me know. Ms. Grady. Good evening. Um, I want to thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I have quite a few questions, but I'm only going to focus on one. Um, it's regarding the transportation. Um, I know that planning starts early on. My question to you is, um, what, what are we doing? I, I know that usually there's always glitches when the school starts and uh, sometimes the communication is not the same even when parents call the school and they ask the school about buses and sometimes the answers could be very vague about not knowing like that's not we don't we don't deal with transportation so just wanting to figure out and if you've gotten that feedback and what are some things that you're doing to be proactive so that that communication is strong at the very beginning uh, of the school year and as well as the, the, the routes are, are as much as possible. Um, the drivers are, are in the know of, of what that, those routes should be so that, um, so that we can just get better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we're looking at is getting our routes in order earlier in the year. So we're starting to plan right now uh, for routes for next year. We also have a routing task force where we're involving our drivers and other staff in giving us feedback on what we can do to make our routes more efficient and um, better planning of those routes. So what we, and in the summer in August, we do have every driver come in and they bid their routes and then they also practice those routes. We wanna give them time enough to get their practice runs in so that we can make any adjustments that we need to make. Um, there is a cutoff date though, sometimes we have students who may enroll after the routes are already set up so we do make adjustments as, as fast as we can but it's if we had all the information um, in advance then it would be easier to get all those routes exactly right um, but whenever students we have to make some changes then we need to um, increase the time on some of those routes and try to get that information out um, another area that we're focusing on is, and I may have mentioned this before, we want to be proactive in getting information out to parents when there are mm -hmm. delays with our buses. So we've partnered with the communications department and we are looking at using um, a system similar to um, the county government um, and sending text, text alerts to our parents, also looking at the possible use of Twitter to get that information out as is done in some of the other school districts that I'm familiar with. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Ms. Mundy. Thank you. I just had two quick questions. Um, this is for Ms. Shorter in the food service or food and nutrition services. Um, you mentioned the new online payment method. Is that the My School Bucks? Yes. Um, because I just recently had a conversation with a parent mm -hmm. about the My School Bucks um, portal. And one of the issues that came up from her was the administration fee that parents are charged when having to deposit, you know, money on the account. And so it, it seems insignificant, but for parents who want to keep costs down and want to make sure that lunch is affordable um, and putting money into those accounts, I just didn't know if there were other options or other ways or other things that we've looked at for you know, online or for convenience methods for um, putting money on accounts for school lunch. And, th and that's come across to me in several occasions because it comes across also in before and after care and other. Right. So that is the, the payment portal. So they are a third party provider to us. So it's an option for parents. So they still have that option of coming to the school um, and putting money on the account. So it's just a convenience fee um, of that option being available to them. Okay. And it also gives them access to the student's account so they can look at the account and see everything that's manage purchased it. and manage the account from there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. My second question was for, um, for Rex. And it just was a quick question. Um, I had a parent today who spoke um, and from Suitland High School and was interested in security um, after an incident there. And that school in particular has come over and spoken to me about their concerns regarding staffing. Um, the layout for that school is really different because they have the building, the main building, and then they have like a sub building that's all on the same campus. So their structure is a little different. Um, than most high schools. Um, so I had just two quick questions about security and staffing levels at high schools. Um, are they reviewed regularly to see um, if they are adequate in meeting the current needs? If they are, how often is that assessment done? Um, is there a process for um, school administration or teacher, uh, excuse me, principals, leaders in the school to say we need more assistance, we're seeing something here or there? How are staffing levels constantly monitored to make sure they're adequate? Actually, I'm glad you asked that. We actually do the uh, assessment annually. Um, normally every June, what I'll do is I'll get a uh, uh, anticipated uh, student population list um, from people uh, and, and boundaries. Um, I also look at the layout of the campus because there are several campuses out there that are either really large or they're really, you know, there's five floors. Um, so we use a combination of things. Um, and then also I look at the prior incident data from the year prior. Um, so I put all that together, and then I, it's not just me in a vacuum. I do it with uh, my executive leadership team, as well as I allow input for the principals. Because um, there's other things too, um, like some of the things that Mr. Valentine said, we have to make sure too that we have the right fits at every school, personality-wise, at least for our team leaders, to make sure that this principal and that uh, leadership team, they're seeing eye to eye and they're doing the same thing. So I do it annually, um, and it's based off student population, campus layout, and incident data from the prior year. Um, and we do make our adjustments. There's some schools that they, they decrease in student population, so I'm able to take uh, an individual from that school and move them to one where the population either increased or had a high number of incidents, and we need more presence. Um, for Suitland in particular, we do have eight staff members there. That is the highest compliment we have throughout the school system. Uh, hopefully that helps. Yeah, and just, just the follow-up question about if they're, if the school leadership though, if there's a need, an additional need, is that assessed? Are they provided that support? How they are. That? And then uh, obviously I'll take, I'll make a request as well up to my superiors. Um, and then, you know, we look at obviously, you know, what our fiscal situation is um, when making those uh, decisions. Um, and then if I have to, if I have to move from one school to another, we do that also in the, uh, in the off season as I call it. You're welcome. Ms. Hernandez. Uh, good evening. I think for the most part, many of my questions have been covered, so I will just go to the one that hasn't yet, and this is for Ms. Carter Evans in regards to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the uh, stop arm cameras on the buses. Um, 20 buses, right? Uh, has this, have you or the school system been working on the, like, the placement of the buses, like the routes, which, you know, which area the buses get to go in? as far as 
right now Morning. we're working with the county police mm -hmm. so that they can um, they've identified some hot spots for us so we actually um, when they were installed on our buses we installed them so that they would cover the whole county right. so now that we know where the hot spots are where motorists are passing our buses then we're going to work with our union so that we could re we could move those buses around to certain areas because right now the drivers when they bid their routes they also are assigned certain buses so those buses generally stay with the route so we want to make sure that we have those cameras in the right places so we're going to start to um, move them to those hot spot areas okay. and it's been almost this school year that it's been in place it start it they were installed um, in August okay uh, now as far as uh, the program expanding do you imagine that perhaps the results of this year would kind of either expand more more cameras on buses right now we're not seeing the results that we thought we would see so we are just gonna right now try to move those cameras around and see if that's going to increase the number of um, violations that we're able to um, capture on camera there are some violations but they're not all captured on camera so because they are in some of those hot spot areas where maybe there aren't enough buses traveling through with those cameras okay and uh, the police department from my understanding understanding is involved with uh, like the actual purchasing of the cameras the mounting of the cameras the maintenance and so the school system is just kind of being in a partner that you know helps them out with the buses yes we've partnered with them and they actually oversee the project and uh, the pictures that are taken go directly to them so okay. any of the data um, received from those cameras they would have that great okay that's it for me thank you that's all we got anybody want to go for round two <laughs> all right thank you folks very much for, for answering those questions and for that great presentation and for sticking around with us. And, and, you know, and, and, and as always, well, at this point of the game, we tend to uh, lose the public. I wanna thank my colleagues in the union, uh, in our unions who have stuck it out uh, uh, for us through the bitter end, because you guys did this voluntarily. We appreciate that, thank you. Thank you. And now, colleagues, may I have a motion to confirm actions taken in executive session. It's been, it's been properly moved and seconded that the Board of Education hereby approve actions taken in executive session on February 12, 2015, related to personnel appointments, personnel matters, legal matters, administrative matters. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed? May Curtis please give us a motion to adjourn. <laughs> May Lynn second it. Who's there stand up? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. Have a great evening.